The sun beat on the crowded pinnacles of southern hills and glared into deep, stony river beds where the water was shrunk beneath the high slum bridge so that washerwomen kneeling on hot stones could scarcely wet their linen, and lean mules went picking their way among the chattering grey stones with panniers slung across their narrow shoulders. At midday the heat of the sun made the hills grey as if shaved and singed in an explosion, while, further north, in cloudier and rainier countries hills smoothed into slabs as with the back of a spade had a light in them as if a warder, deep within, went from chamber to chamber carrying a green lamp. Through atoms of grey-blue air the sun struck at English fields and lit up marshes and pools, a white gull on a stake, the slow sail of shadows over blunt-headed woods and young corn and flowing hayfields. It beat on the orchard wall, and every pit and grain of the brick was silver-pointed, purple, fiery as if soft to touch, as if touched it must melt into hot-baked grains of dust. The currents hung against the wall in ripples and cascades of polished red, plums swelled out their leaves, and all the blades of the grass were run together in one fluent green blaze. The tree's shadow was sunk to a dark pool at the root. Light descending in floods dissolved the separate foliation into one green mound. The birds sang passionate songs addressed to one ear only and then stopped. Bubbling and chuckling they carried little bits of straw and twig to the dark knots in the higher branches of the trees. Gilt and purple they perched in the garden where cones of laburnum and purple shook down gold and lilac, for now at midday the garden was all blossom and profusion and even the tunnels under the plants were green and purple and tawny as the sun beat through the red petal, or the broad yellow petal, or was barred by some thickly furred green stalk. The sun struck straight upon the house making the white walls glare between the dark windows. Their panes, woven thickly with green branches, held circles of impenetrable darkness. Sharp-edged wedges of light lay upon the windowsill and showed inside the room plates with blue rings, cups with curved handles, the bulge of a great bowl, the crisscross pattern in the rug, and the formidable corners and lines of cabinets and bookcases. Behind their conglomeration hung a zone of shadow in which might be a further shape to be disencumbered of shadow or still denser depths of darkness. The waves broke and spread their waters swiftly over the shore. One after another they massed themselves and fell, the spray tossed itself back with the energy of their fall. The waves were steeped deep blue save for a pattern of diamond-pointed light on their backs which rippled as the backs of great horses ripple with muscles as they move. The waves fell, withdrew and fell again, like the thud of a great beast stamping. He is dead, said Neville. He fell. His horse tripped. He was thrown. The sails of the world have swung round and caught me on the head. All is over. The lights of the world have gone out. There stands the tree which I cannot pass. Oh! To crumple this telegram in my fingers, to let the light of the world flood back, to say this has not happened. But why turn one's head hither and thither? This is the truth. This is the fact. His horse stumbled, he was thrown. The flashing trees and white rails went up in a shower. There was a surge, a drumming in his ears. Then the blow, the world crashed, he breathed heavily. He died where he fell. Barns and summer days in the country, rooms where we sat, all now lie in the unreal world which is gone. My past is cut from me. They came running. They carried him to some pavilion, men in riding boots, men in sun helmets, among unknown men he died. Loneliness and silence often surrounded him. He often left me. And then, returning, see where he comes. I said. Women shuffle past the window as if there were no gulf cut in the street, no tree with stiff leaves which we cannot pass. We deserve then to be tripped by molehills. We are infinitely abject, shuffling past with our eyes shut. But why should I submit? Why try to lift my foot and mount the stair? This is where I stand, here, holding the telegram. The past, summer days, and rooms where we sat, stream away like burnt paper with red eyes in it. Why meet and resume? Why talk and eat and make up other combinations with other people? From this moment I am solitary. 
no one will know me now. I have three letters, I am about to play quoits with a colonel, so no more, thus he ends our friendship, shouldering his way through the crowd with a wave of his hand. This farce is worth no more formal celebration. Yet if someone had but said, wait, had pulled the strap three holes tighter he would have done justice for fifty years, and sat in court and ridden alone at the head of troops and denounced some monstrous tyranny, and come back to us. Now I say there is a grinning, there is a subterfuge. There is something sneering behind our backs. That boy almost lost his footing as he leapt on the bus. Percival fell, was killed, is buried, and I watch people passing, holding tight to the rails of omnibuses, determined to save their lives. I will not lift my foot to climb the stair. I will stand for one moment beneath the immitigable tree, alone with the man whose throat is cut, while downstairs the cook shoves in and out the dampers. I will not climb the stair. We are doomed, all of us. Women shuffle past with shopping bags. People keep on passing. Yet you shall not destroy me. For this moment, this one moment, we are together. I press you to me. Come, pain, feed on me. Bury your fangs in my flesh. Tear me asunder. I sob, I sob. Such is the incomprehensible combination, said Bernard, such is the complexity of things, that as I descend the staircase I do not know which is sorrow, which joy. My son is born, Percival is dead. I am upheld by pillars, shored up on either side by stark emotions, but which is sorrow, which is joy? I ask, and do not know, only that I need silence, and to be alone and to go out, and to save one hour to consider what has happened to my world, what death has done to my world. This then is the world that Percival sees no longer. Let me look. The butcher delivers meat next door, two old men stumble along the pavement, sparrows alight. The machine then works, I note the rhythm, the throb, but as a thing in which I have no part, since he sees it no longer. He lies pale and bandaged in some room. Now then is my chance to find out what is of great importance, and I must be careful, and tell no lies. About him my feeling was, he sat there in the centre. Now I go to that spot no longer. The place is empty. Oh yes, I can assure you, men in felt hats and women carrying baskets, you have lost something that would have been very valuable to you. You have lost a leader whom you would have followed, and one of you has lost happiness and children. He is dead who would have given you that. He lies on a camp bed, bandaged, in some hot Indian hospital while coolies squatted on the floor agitate those fans, I forget how they call them. But this is important, you are well out of it, I said while the doves descended over the roofs and my son was born, as if it were a fact. I remember, as a boy, his curious air of detachment. And I go on to say, my eyes fill with tears and then are dry, but this is better than one had dared to hope. I say, addressing what is abstract, facing me eyeless at the end of the avenue, in the sky, is this the utmost you can do? Then we have triumphed. You have done your utmost, I say, addressing that blank and brutal face, for he was twenty-five and should have lived to be eighty, without avail. I am not going to lie down and weep away a life of care. An entry to be made in my pocketbook, contempt for those who inflict meaningless death. Further, this is important, that I should be able to place him in trifling and ridiculous situations, so that he may not feel himself absurd, perched on a great horse. I must be able to say, Percival, a ridiculous name. At the same time let me tell you, men and women, hurrying to the tube station, you would have had to respect him. You would have had to form up and follow behind him. How strange to all one's way through crowds seeing life through hollow eyes, burning eyes. Yet already signals begin, beckonings, attempts to lure me back. Curiosity is knocked out for only a short time. One cannot live outside the machine for more perhaps than half an hour. Bodies, I note, already begin to look ordinary, but what is behind them differs, the perspective. 
Behind that newspaper placard is the hospital, the long room with black men pulling ropes, and then they bury him. Yet since it says a famous actress has been divorced, I ask instantly which. Yet I cannot take out my penny, I cannot buy a paper, I cannot suffer interruption yet. I ask, if I shall never see you again and fix my eyes on that solidity, what form will our communication take? You have gone across the court, further and further, drawing finer and finer the thread between us. But you exist somewhere. Something of you remains. A judge. That is, if I discover a new vein in myself I shall submit it to you privately. I shall ask, what is your verdict? You shall remain the arbiter. But for how long? Things will become too difficult to explain, there will be new things, already my son. I am now at the zenith of an experience. It will decline. Already I no longer cry with conviction, what luck! Exaltation, the flight of doves descending, is over. Chaos, detail return. I am no longer amazed by names written over shop windows. I do not feel why hurry. Why catch trains? The sequence returns, one thing leads to another, the usual order. Yes, but I still resent the usual order. I will not let myself be made yet to accept the sequence of things. I will walk, I will not change the rhythm of my mind by stopping, by looking, I will walk. I will go up these steps into the gallery and submit myself to the influence of minds like mine outside the sequence. There is little time left to answer the question, my powers flag, I become torpid. Here are pictures. Here are cold madonnas among their pillars. Let them lay to rest the incessant activity of the mind's eye, the bandaged head, the men with ropes, so that I may find something unvisual beneath. Here are gardens, and Venus among her flowers, here are saints and blue madonnas. Mercifully these pictures make no reference, they do not nudge, they do not point. Thus they expand my consciousness of him and bring him back to me differently. I remember his beauty. Look, where he comes, I said. Lines and colours almost persuade me that I too can be heroic, I, who make phrases so easily, am so soon seduced, love what comes next, and cannot clench my fist, but vacillate weakly making phrases according to my circumstances. Now, through my own infirmity I recover what he was to me, my opposite. Being naturally truthful, he did not see the point of these exaggerations, and was borne on by a natural sense of the fitting was indeed a great master of the art of living so that he seems to have lived long, and to have spread calm round him, indifference one might almost say, certainly to his own advancement, save that he had also great compassion. A child playing a summer evening, doors will open and shut, will keep opening and shutting, through which I see sights that make me weep. For they cannot be imparted. Hence our loneliness, hence our desolation. I turn to that spot in my mind and find it empty. My own infirmities oppress me. There is no longer him to oppose them. Behold, then, the blue Madonna streaked with tears. This is my funeral service. We have no ceremonies, only private dirges and no conclusions, only violent sensations, each separate. Nothing that has been said meets our case. We sit in the Italian room at the National Gallery picking up fragments. I doubt that Titian ever felt this rat gnaw. Painters live lives of methodical absorption, adding stroke to stroke. They are not like poets, scapegoats, they are not chained to the rock. Hence the silence, the sublimity. Yet that crimson must have bent in Titian's gizzard. No doubt he rose with the great arms holding the cornucopia, and fell, in that descent. But the silence weighs on me the perpetual solicitation of the eye. The pressure is intermittent and muffled. I distinguish too little and too vaguely. The bell is pressed and I do not ring or give out irrelevant clamours all jangled. I am titillated inordinately by some splendour, the ruffled crimson against the green lining, the march of pillars, the orange light behind the black, pricked ears of the olive trees. Arrows of sensation strike from my spine, but without order.
yet something is added to my interpretation. Something lies deeply buried. For one moment I thought to grasp it. But bury it, bury it, let it breed, hidden in the depths of my mind some day to fructify. After a long lifetime, loosely, in a moment of revelation, I may lay hands on it, but now the idea breaks in my hand. Ideas break a thousand times for once that they globe themselves entire. They break, they fall over me. Line and colors they survive, therefore. I am yawning. I am glutted with sensations. I am exhausted with the strain and the long, long time, twenty-five minutes, half an hour, that I have held myself alone outside the machine. I grow numb, I grow stiff. How shall I break up this numbness which discredits my sympathetic heart? There are others suffering, multitudes of people suffering. Neville suffers. He loved Percival. But I can no longer endure extremities, I want someone with whom to laugh, with whom to yawn, with whom to remember how he scratched his head, someone he was at ease with and liked, not Susan, whom he loved, but Ginny rather. In her room also I could do penance. I could ask, did he tell you how I refused him when he asked me to go to Hampton Court that day? Those are the thoughts that will wake me leaping in anguish in the middle of the night, the crimes for which one would do penance in all the markets of the world bareheaded, that one did not go to Hampton Court that day. But now I want life round me, and books and little ornaments, and the usual sounds of tradesmen calling on which to pillow my head after this exhaustion, and shut my eyes after this revelation. I will go straight, then, down the stairs, and hail the first taxi and drive to Ginny. There is the puddle, said Rhoda, and I cannot cross it. I hear the rush of the great grindstone within an inch of my head. Its wind roars in my face. All palpable forms of life have failed me. Unless I can stretch and touch something hard, I shall be blown down the eternal corridors forever. What, then, can I touch? What brick, what stone? And so draw myself across the enormous gulf into my body safely. Now the shadow has fallen and the purple light slants downwards. The figure that was robed in beauty is now clothed in ruin. The figure that stood in the grove where the steep-backed hills come down falls in ruin, as I told them when they said they loved his voice on the stair, and his old shoes and moments of being together. Now I will walk down Oxford Street envisaging a world rent by lightning, I will look at oaks cracked asunder and read where the flowering branch has fallen. I will go to Oxford Street and buy stockings for a party. I will do the usual things under the lightning flash. On the bare ground I will pick violets and bind them together and offer them to Percival, something given him by me. Look now at what Percival has given me. Look at the street now that Percival is dead. The houses are lightly founded to be puffed over by a breath of air. Reckless and random the cars race and roar and hunt us to death like bloodhounds. I am alone in a hostile world. The human face is hideous. This is to my liking. I want publicity and violence and to be dashed like a stone on the rocks. I like factory chimneys and cranes and lorries. I like the passing of face and face and face, deformed, indifferent. I am sick of prettiness, I am sick of privacy. I ride rough waters and shall sink with no one to save me. Percival, by his death, has made me this present, has revealed this terror, has left me to undergo this humiliation, faces and faces, served out like soup plates by scullions, coarse, greedy, casual, looking in at shop windows with pendant parcels, ogling, brushing, destroying everything, leaving even our love impure, touched now by their dirty fingers. Here is the shop where they sell stockings. And I could believe that beauty is once more set flowing. Its whisper comes down these aisles, through these laces, breathing among baskets of coloured ribbons. There are then warm hollows grooved in the heart of the uproar, alcoves of silence where we can shelter under the wing of beauty from truth which I desire. Pain is suspended as a girl silently slides open a drawer. And then, she speaks, her voice wakes me. I shoot to the bottom among the weeds and see envy, jealousy, 
hatred, and spite scuttle like crabs over the sand as she speaks. These are our companions. I will pay my bill and take my parcel. This is Oxford Street. Here are hate, jealousy, hurry, and indifference frothed into the wild semblance of life. These are our companions. Consider the friends with whom we sit and eat. I think of Louis, reading the sporting column of an evening newspaper, afraid of ridicule, a snob. He says, looking at the people passing, he will shepherd us if we will follow. If we submit he will reduce us to order. Thus he will smooth out the death of Percival to his satisfaction, looking fixedly over the cruet, past the houses at the sky. Bernard, meanwhile, flops red-eyed into some armchair. He will have out his notebook, under D, he will enter phrases to be used on the deaths of friends. Ginny, pirouetting across the room, will perch on the arm of his chair and ask, did he love me? More than he loved Susan. Susan, engaged to her farmer in the country, will stand for a second with the telegram before her, holding a plate, and then, with a kick of her heel, slam to the oven door. Neville, after staring at the window through his tears, will see through his tears, and ask, who passes the window? What lovely boy! This is my tribute to Percival, withered violets, blackened violets. Where shall I go then? To some museum, where they keep rings under glass cases, where there are cabinets, and the dresses that queens have worn. Or shall I go to Hampton Court and look at the red walls and courtyards and the seamliness of herded yew trees making black pyramids symmetrically on the grass among flowers? There shall I recover beauty, and impose order upon my raked, my dishevelled soul. But what can one make in loneliness? Alone I should stand on the empty grass and say, rooks fly, somebody passes with a bag, there is a gardener with a wheelbarrow. I should stand in a queue and smell sweat, and scent as horrible as sweat, and be hung with other people like a joint of meat among other joints of meat. Here is a hall where one pays money and goes in, where one hears music among somnolent people who have come here after lunch on a hot afternoon. We have eaten beef and pudding enough to live for a week without tasting food. Therefore we cluster like maggots on the back of something that will carry us on. Decorous, portly, we have white hair waved under our hats, slim shoes, little bags, clean-shaven cheeks, here and there a military moustache, not a speck of dust has been allowed to settle anywhere on our broadcloth. Swaying and opening programs, with a few words of greeting to friends, we settle down, like walruses stranded on rocks, like heavy bodies incapable of waddling to the sea, hoping for a wave to lift us, but we are too heavy, and too much dry shingle lies between us and the sea. We lie gorged with food, torpid in the heat. Then, swollen but contained in slippery satin, the sea green woman comes to our rescue. She sucks in her lips, assumes an air of intensity, inflates herself and hurls herself precisely at the right moment as if she saw an apple and her voice was the arrow into the note, ah. An axe has split a tree to the core, the core is warm, sound quivers within the bark. Ah, cried a woman to her lover, leaning from her window in Venice. Ah, ah, she cried, and again she cries ah. She has provided us with a cry. But only a cry. And what is a cry? Then the beetle-shaped men come with their violins, wait, count, nod, down come their boughs. And there is ripple and laughter like the dance of olive trees and their myriad-tongued grey leaves when a seafarer, biting a twig between his lips where the menibacked steep hills come down, leaps on shore. Like and like and like, but what is the thing that lies beneath the semblance of the thing? Now that lightning has gashed the tree and the flowering branch has fallen and Percival, by his death, has made me this gift, let me see the thing. There is a square, there is an oblong. The players take the square and place it upon the oblong. They place it very accurately, they make a perfect dwelling place. Very little is left outside. The structure is now visible, what is inchoate is here stated, we are not so various or so mean. We have made oblongs and stood them upon squares. This is our triumph, this is our consolation. 
The sweetness of this content overflowing runs down the walls of my mind, and liberates understanding. Wonder no more, I say, this is the end. The oblong has been set upon the square, the spiral is on top. We have been hauled over the shingle, down to the sea. The players come again. But they are mopping their faces. They are no longer so spruce or so debonair. I will go. I will set aside this afternoon. I will make a pilgrimage. I will go to Greenwich. I will fling myself fearlessly into trams, into omnibuses. As we lurch down Regent Street, and I am flung upon this woman, upon this man, I am not injured, I am not outraged by the collision. A square stands upon an oblong. Here are mean streets where chaffering goes on in street markets, and every sort of iron rod, bolt, and screw is laid out, and people swarm off the pavement, pinching raw meat with thick fingers. The structure is visible. We have made a dwelling place. These, then, are the flowers that grow among the rough grasses of the field which the cows trample, wind-bitten, almost deformed, without fruit or blossom. These are what I bring, torn up by the roots from the pavement of Oxford Street, my penny bunch, my penny bunch of violets. Now from the window of the tram I see masts among chimneys, there is the river, there are ships that sail to India. I will walk by the river. I will pace this embankment, where an old man reads a newspaper in a glass shelter. I will pace this terrace and watch the ships bowling down the tide. A woman walks on deck, with a dog barking round her. Her skirts are blown, her hair is blown, they are going out to sea, they are leaving us, they are vanishing this summer evening. Now I will relinquish, now I will let loose. Now I will at last free the checked, the jerked back desire to be spent, to be consumed. We will gallop together over desert hills where the swallow dips her wings in dark pools and the pillars stand entire. Into the wave that dashes upon the shore, into the wave that flings its white foam to the uttermost corners of the earth, I throw my violets, my offering to Percival. The sun no longer stood in the middle of the sky. Its light slanted, falling obliquely. Here it caught on the edge of a cloud and bent it into a slice of light, a blazing island on which no foot could rest. Then another cloud was caught in the light and another and another, so that the waves beneath were arrow-struck with fiery feathered darts that shot erratically across the quivering blue. The topmost leaves of the tree were crisped in the sun. They rustled stiffly in the random breeze. The birds sat still save that they flicked their heads sharply from side to side. Now they paused in their song as if glutted with sound, as if the fullness of midday had gorged them. The dragonfly poised motionless over a reed, then shot its blue stitch further through the air. The far hum in the distance seemed made of the broken tremor of fine wings dancing up and down on the horizon. The river water held the reeds now fixed as if glass had hardened round them, and then the glass wavered and the reeds swept low. Pondering, sunken-headed, the cattle stood in the fields and cumbrously moved one foot and then another. In the bucket near the house the tap stopped dripping, as if the bucket were full, and then the tap dripped one, two, three separate drops in succession. The windows showed erratically spots of burning fire, the elbow of one branch, and then some tranquil space of pure clarity. The blind hung red at the window's edge and within the room daggers of light fell upon chairs and tables making cracks across their lacquer and polish. The green pot bulged enormously, with its white window elongated in its side. Light driving darkness before it spilt itself profusely upon the corners and bosses, and yet heaped up darkness in mounds of unmolded shape. The waves massed themselves, curved their backs and crashed. Up spurted stones and shingle. They swept round the rocks, and the spray, leaping high, spattered the walls of a cave that had been dry before, and left pools inland, where some fish stranded lashed its tail as the wave drew back. I have signed my name, said Louis, already twenty times. I, and again I, and again I, clear, firm, unequivocal, there it stands, my name. Clear-cut and unequivocal am I too. Yet a vast inheritance of experience is packed in me. I have lived thousands of years. 
I am like a worm that has eaten its way through the wood of a very old oak beam. But now I am compact, now I am gathered together this fine morning. The sun shines from a clear sky. But twelve o'clock brings neither rain nor sunshine. It is the hour when Miss Johnson brings me my letters in a wire tray. Upon these white sheets I indent my name. The whisper of leaves, water running down gutters, green depths flecked with dahlias or zinnias, I, now a duke, now Plato, companion of Socrates, the tramp of dark men and yellow men migrating east, west, north and south, the eternal procession, women going with attaché cases down the strand as they went once with pitchers to the Nile, all the furled and close-packed leaves of my manifolded life are now summed in my name, incised cleanly and barely on the sheet. Now a full-grown man, now upright standing in sun or rain. I must drop heavy as a hatchet and cut the oak with my sheer weight, for if I deviate, glancing this way, or that way, I shall fall like snow and be wasted. I am half in love with the typewriter and the telephone. With letters and cables and brief but courteous commands on the telephone to Paris, Berlin, New York, I have fused my many lives into one, I have helped by my assiduity and decision to score those lines on the map there by which the different parts of the world are laced together. I love punctually at ten to come into my room, I love the purple glow of the dark mahogany, I love the table and its sharp edge, and the smooth running drawers. I love the telephone with its lips stretched to my whisper, and the date on the wall, and the engagement book. Mr. Prentice at four, Mr. S. Sharp at 4.30. I like to be asked to come to Mr. Batchard's private room and report on our commitments to China. I hope to inherit an armchair and a turkey carpet. My shoulder is to the wheel, I roll the dark before me, spreading commerce where there was chaos in the far parts of the world. If I press on from chaos making order, I shall find myself where Chatham stood, and Pitt, Burke and Sir Robert Peel. Thus I expunge certain stains, and erase old defilements, the woman who gave me a flag from the top of the Christmas tree, my accent, beatings and other tortures, the boasting boys, my father, a banker at Brisbane. I have read my poet in an eating house, and, stirring my coffee, Listen to the clerks making bets at the little tables, watch the women hesitating at the counter. I said that nothing should be irrelevant, like a piece of brown paper dropped casually on the floor. I said their journeys should have an end in view, they should earn their two pound ten a week at the command of an august master, some hand, some robe, should fold us about in the evening. When I have healed these fractures and comprehended these monstrosities so that they need neither excuse nor apology, which both waste our strength, I shall give back to the street and the eating shop what they lost when they fell on these hard times and broke on these stony beaches. I shall assemble a few words and forge round us a hammered ring of beaten steel. But now I have not a moment to spare. There is no respite here, no shadow made of quivering leaves, or alcove to which one can retreat from the sun, to sit, with a lover, in the cool of the evening. The weight of the world is on our shoulders, its vision is through our eyes, if we blink or look aside, or turn back to finger what Plato said or remember Napoleon and his conquests, we inflict on the world the injury of some obliquity. This is life, Mr. Prentice at four, Mr. Ayres at 4.30. I like to hear the soft rush of the lift and the thud with which it stops on my landing and the heavy male tread of responsible feet down the corridors. So by dint of our united exertions we send ships to the remotest parts of the globe, replete with lavatories and gymnasiums. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. This is life. If I press on, I shall inherit a chair and a rug, a place in Surrey with glass houses, and some rare conifer, melon or flowering tree which other merchants will envy. Yet I still keep my attic room. There I open the usual little book, there I watch the rain glisten on the tiles till they shine like a policeman's waterproof, there I see the broken windows in poor people's houses, the lean cats, some slattern squinting in a cracked looking glass as she arranges her face for the street corner, their rodor sometimes comes. For we are lovers. Passival has died, he died in Egypt, he died in Greece, all deaths are one death. Susan has children. Neville mounts rapidly to the conspicuous heights. 
Life passes. The clouds change perpetually over our houses. I do this, do that, and again do this and then that. Meeting and parting, we assemble different forms, make different patterns. But if I do not nail these impressions to the board and out of the many men in me make one, exist here and now and not in streaks and patches, like scattered snow wreaths on far mountains, and ask Miss Johnson as I pass through the office about the movies and take my cup of tea and accept also my favorite biscuit, then I shall fall like snow and be wasted. Yet when six o'clock comes and I touch my hat to the commissionaire, being always too effusive in ceremony since I desire so much to be accepted, and struggle, leaning against the wind, buttoned up, with my jaws blue and my eyes running water, I wish that a little typist would cuddle on my knees, I think that my favorite dish is liver and bacon, and so am apt to wander to the river, to the narrow streets where there are frequent public houses, and the shadows of ships passing at the end of the street, and women fighting. But I say to myself, recovering my sanity, Mr. Prentice at four, Mr. Ayres at 4.30. The hatchet must fall on the block, the oak must be cleft to the centre. The weight of the world is on my shoulders. Here is the pen and the paper, on the letters in the wire basket I sign my name, I, I, and again I. Summer comes, and winter, said Susan. The seasons pass. The pear fills itself and drops from the tree. The dead leaf rests on its edge. But steam has obscured the window. I sit by the fire watching the kettle boil. I see the pear tree through the streaked steam on the window pane. Sleep, sleep, I croon, whether it is summer or winter, May or November. Sleep I sing, I, who am unmelodious and hear no music save rustic music when a dog barks, a bell tinkles, or wheels crunch upon the gravel. I sing my song by the fire like an old shell murmuring on the beach. Sleep, sleep, I say, warning off with my voice all who rattle milk cans, fire at rooks, shoot rabbits, or in any way bring the shock of destruction near this wicker cradle, laden with soft limbs, curled under a pink coverlet. I have lost my indifference, my blank eyes, my pear-shaped eyes that soar to the root. I am no longer January, May or any other season, but am all spun to a fine thread round the cradle, wrapping in a cocoon made of my own blood the delicate limbs of my baby. Sleep, I say, and feel within me uprush some wilder, darker violence, so that I would fell down with one blow any intruder, any snatcher, who should break into this room and wake the sleeper. I pad about the house all day long in apron and slippers, like my mother who died of cancer. Whether it is summer, whether it is winter, I no longer know by the more grass, and the heath flower, only by the steam on the window pane, or the frost on the window pane. When the lark peels high his ring of sound and it falls through the air like an apple paring, I stoop, I feed my baby. I, who used to walk through beechwoods noting the jay's feather turning blue as it falls, past the shepherd and the tramp, who stared at the woman squatted beside a tilted cart in a ditch, go from room to room with a duster. Sleep, I say, desiring sleep to fall like a blanket of down and cover these weak limbs, demanding that life shall sheath its claws and gird its lightning and pass by, making of my own body a hollow, a warm shelter for my child to sleep in. Sleep, I say, sleep. Or I go to the window, I look at the rook's high nest, and the pear tree. His eyes will see when mine are shut, I think. I shall go mixed with them beyond my body and shall see India. He will come home, bringing trophies to be laid at my feet. He will increase my possessions. But I never rise at dawn and see the purple drops in the cabbage leaves, the red drops in the roses. I do not watch the setter nose in a circle, or lie at night watching the leaves hide the stars and the stars move and the leaves hang still. The butcher calls, the milk has to be stood under a shade lest it should sour. Sleep, I say, sleep, as the kettle boils and its breath comes thicker and thicker issuing in one jet from the spout. So life fills my veins. So life pours through my limbs. So I am driven forward, till I could cry, as I move from dawn to dusk opening and shutting, no more. 
I am glutted with natural happiness. Yet more will come, more children, more cradles, more baskets in the kitchen and hams ripening, and onions glistening, and more beds of lettuce and potatoes. I am blown like a leaf by the gale, now brushing the wet grass, now whirled up. I am glutted with natural happiness, and wish sometimes that the fullness would pass from me and the weight of the sleeping house rise, when we sit reading, and I stay the thread at the eye of my needle. The lamp kindles a fire in the dark pane. A fire burns in the heart of the ivy. I see a lit up street in the evergreens. I hear traffic in the brush of the wine down the lane, and broken voices, and laughter, and Jimmy who cries as the door opens, come. Come. But no sound breaks the silence of our house, where the fields sigh close to the door. The wind washes through the elm trees, a moth hits the lamp, a cow lows, a crack of sound starts in the rafter, and I push my head through the needle and murmur, sleep dot. Now is the moment, said Ginny. Now we have met, and have come together. Now let us talk, let us tell stories. Who is he? Who is she? I am infinitely curious and do not know what is to come. If you, whom I meet for the first time, were to say to me, the coach starts at four from Piccadilly, I would not stay to fling a few necessaries in a bandbox, but would come at once. Let us sit here under the cut flowers, on the sofa by the picture. Let us decorate our Christmas tree with facts and again with facts. People are so soon gone, let us catch them. That man there, by the cabinet, he lives you say, surrounded by china pots. Break one and you shatter a thousand pounds. And he loved a girl in Rome and she left him. Hence the pots, old junk found in lodging houses or dug from the desert sands. And since beauty must be broken daily to remain beautiful, and he is static, his life stagnates in a china sea. It is strange though, for once as a young man, he sat on damp ground and drank rum with soldiers. One must be quick and add facts deftly, like toys to a tree, fixing them with a twist of the fingers. He stoops, how he stoops, even over an azalea. He stoops over the old woman even, because she wears diamonds in her ears, and, bundling about her estate in a pony carriage, directs who is to be helped, what tree felled, and who turned out tomorrow. I have lived my life. I must tell you, all these years, and I am now past thirty, perilously, like a mountain goat, leaping from crag to crag, I do not settle long anywhere, I do not attach myself to one person in particular, but you will find that if I raise my arm, some figure at once breaks off and will come. And that man is a judge, and that man is a millionaire, and that man, with the eyeglass, shot his governess through the heart with an arrow when he was ten years old. Afterwards he rode through deserts with despatches, took part in revolutions and now collects materials for a history of his mother's family, long settled in Norfolk. That little man with a blue chin has a right hand that is withered. But why? We do not know. That woman, you whisper discreetly, with the pearl pagodas hanging from her ears, was the pure flame who lit the life of one of our statesmen, now since his death she sees ghosts, tells fortunes, and has adopted a coffee-coloured youth whom she calls the Messiah. That man with the drooping moustache, like a cavalry officer, lived a life of the utmost debauchery, it is all in some memoir, until one day he met a stranger in a train who converted him between Edinburgh and Carlisle by reading the Bible. Thus, in a few seconds, deftly, adroitly, we decipher the hieroglyphs written on other people's faces. Here, in this room, are the abraded and battered shells cast on the shore. The door goes on opening. The room fills and fills with knowledge, anguish, many kinds of ambition, much indifference, some despair. Between us, you say, we could build cathedrals, dictate policies, condemn men to death, and administer the affairs of several public offices. The common fund of experience is very deep. We have between us scores of children of both sexes, whom we are educating, going to see at school with the measles, and bringing up to inherit our houses. In one way or another we make this day, this Friday, some by going to the law courts, others to the city, others to the nursery, 
others by marching and forming fours. A million hands stitch, raise hods with bricks. The activity is endless. And tomorrow it begins again, tomorrow we make Saturday. Some take train for France, others ship for India. Some will never come into this room again. One may die tonight. Another will beget a child. From us every sort of building, policy, venture, picture, poem, child, factory, will spring. Life comes, life goes, we make life. So you say. But we who live in the body see with the body's imagination things in outline. I see rocks in bright sunshine. I cannot take these facts into some cave and, shading my eyes, grade their yellows, blues, umbers into one substance. I cannot remain seated for long. I must jump up and go. The coach may start from Piccadilly. I drop all these facts, diamonds, withered hands, china pots and the rest of it as a monkey drops nuts from its naked paws. I cannot tell you if life is this or that. I am going to push out into the heterogeneous crowd. I am going to be buffeted, to be flung up, and flung down, among men, like a ship on the sea. For now my body, my companion, which is always sending its signals, the rough black no, the golden come, in rapid running arrows of sensation, beckons. Someone moves. Did I raise my arm? Did I look? Did my yellow scarf with the strawberry spots float and signal? He is broken from the wall. He follows. I am pursued through the forest. All is wrapped, all is nocturnal, and the parrots go screaming through the branches. All my senses stand erect. Now I feel the roughness of the fibre of the curtain through which I push, now I feel the cold iron railing and its blistered paint beneath my palm. Now the cool tide of darkness breaks its waters over me. We are out of doors. Night opens, night traversed by wandering moths, night hiding lovers roaming to adventure. I smell roses, I smell violets, I see red and blue just hidden. Now gravel is under my shoes, now grass. Up reel the tall backs of houses guilty with lights. All London is uneasy with flashing lights. Now let us sing our love song, come, come, come. Now my gold signal is like a dragonfly flying taut. Jug, 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 I sing like the nightingale whose melody is crowded in the too narrow passage of her throat. Now I hear crash and rending of boughs and the crack of antlers as if the beasts of the forest were all hunting, all rearing high and plunging down among the thorns. One has pierced me. One is driven deep within me. And velvet flowers and leaves whose coolness has been stood in water wash me round, and sheed me, embalming me. Why, look, said Neville, at the clock ticking on the mantelpiece. Time passes, yes. And we grow old. But to sit with you, alone with you, here in London, in this firelit room, you there, I hear, is all. The world ransacked to its uttermost ends, and all its heights stripped and gathered of their flowers holds no more. Look at the firelight running up and down the gold thread in the curtain. The fruit it circles droops heavy. It falls on the toe of your boot, it gives your face a red rim I think it is the firelight and not your face, I think those are books against the wall, and that a curtain, and that perhaps an armchair. But when you come everything changes. The cups and saucers changed when you came in this morning. There can be no doubt, I thought, pushing aside the newspaper, that our mean lives, unsightly as they are, put on splendour and have meaning only under the eyes of love. I rose. I had done my breakfast. There was the whole day before us, and as it was fine, tender, non-committal, we walked through the park to the embankment, along the strand to St. Paul's, then to the shop where I bought an umbrella, always talking, and now and then stopping to look. But can this last? I said to myself, by a lion in Trafalgar Square, by the lion seen once and forever, so I revisit my past life, scene by scene, there is an elm tree, and there lies Percival. Forever and ever, I swore. Then darted in the usual doubt. I clutched your hand. 
you left me. The descent into the tube was like death. We were cut up, we were dissevered by all those faces and the hollow wind that seemed to roar down there over desert boulders. I sat staring in my own room. By five I knew that you were faithless. I snatched the telephone and the buzz, buzz, buzz of its stupid voice in your empty room battered my heart down, when the door opened and there you stood. That was the most perfect of our meetings. But these meetings, these partings, finally destroy us. Now this room seems to me central, something scooped out of the eternal night. Outside lines twist and intersect, but round us, wrapping us about. Here we are centered. Here we can be silent, or speak without raising our voices. Did you notice that and then that? We say. He said that, meaning. She hesitated, and I believe suspected. Anyhow, I heard voices, a sob on the stair late at night. It is the end of their relationship. Thus we spin round us infinitely fine filaments and construct a system. Plato and Shakespeare are included, also quite obscure people, people of no importance whatsoever. I hate men who wear crucifixes on the left side of their waistcoats. I hate ceremonies and lamentations and the sad figure of Christ trembling beside another trembling and sad figure. Also the pomp and the indifference and the emphasis, always on the wrong place, of people holding forth under chandeliers in full evening dress, wearing stars and decorations. Some spray in a hedge, though, or a sunset over a flat winter field, or again the way some old woman sits, arms akimbo, in an omnibus with a basket those we point at for the other to look at. It is so vast an alleviation to be able to point for another to look at. And then not to talk. To follow the dark paths of the mind and enter the past, to visit books, to brush aside their branches and break off some fruit. And you take it and marvel, as I take the careless movements of your body and marvel at its ease, its power how you fling open windows and are dexterous with your hands. For alas! My mind is a little impeded, it soon tires, I fall damp, perhaps disgusting, at the goal. Alas! I could not ride about India in a sun helmet and return to a bungalow. I cannot tumble, as you do, like half-naked boys on the deck of a ship, squirting each other with hose pipes. I want this fire, I want this chair. I want someone to sit beside me after the day's pursuit and all its anguish, after its listenings, and its waitings, and its suspicions. After quarrelling and reconciliation I need privacy, to be alone with you, to set this hubbub in order. For I am as neat as a cat in my habits. We must oppose the waste and deformity of the world, its crowds eddying round and round disgorged and trampling. One must slip paper knives, even, exactly through the pages of novels, and tie up packets of letters neatly with green silk, and brush up the cinders with a hearth broom. Everything must be done to rebuke the horror of deformity. Let us read writers of Roman severity and virtue, let us seek perfection through the sand. Yes, but I love to slip the virtue and severity of the noble Romans under the grey light of your eyes, and dancing grasses and summer breezes and the laughter and shouts of boys at play of naked cabin boys squirting each other with hosepipes on the decks of ships. Hence I am not a disinterested seeker, like Louis, after perfection through the sand. Colours always stain the page, clouds pass over it. And the poem, I think, is only your voice speaking. Alcibiades, Arjux, Hector and Percival are also you. They loved riding, they risked their lives wantonly, they were not great readers either. But you are not Arjux or Percival. They did not wrinkle their noses and scratch their foreheads with your precise gesture. You are you. That is what consoles me for the lack of many things I am ugly, I am weak and the depravity of the world, and the flight of youth and Percival's death and bitterness and rancor and envies innumerable. But if one day you do not come after breakfast, if one day I see you in some looking glass perhaps looking after another, if the telephone buzzes and buzzes in your empty room, I shall then, 
after unspeakable anguish, I shall then, for there is no end to the folly of the human heart, seek another, find another, you. Meanwhile, let us abolish the ticking of time's clock with one blow. Come closer. The sun had now sunk lower in the sky. The islands of cloud had gained in density and drew themselves across the sun so that the rocks went suddenly black, and the trembling sea holly lost its blue and turned silver, and shadows were blown like grey cloths over the sea. The waves no longer visited the further pools or reached the dotted black line which lay irregularly upon the beach. The sand was pearl white, smoothed and shining. Birds swooped and circled high up in the air. Some raced in the furrows of the wind and turned and sliced through them as if they were one body cut into a thousand shreds. Birds fell like a net descending on the treetops. Here one bird taking its way alone made wing for the marsh and sat solitary on a white stake, opening its wings and shutting them. Some petals had fallen in the garden. They lay shell-shaped on the earth. The dead leaf no longer stood upon its edge, but had been blown, now running, now pausing, against some stalk. Through all the flowers the same wave of light passed in a sudden flaunt and flash as if a fin cut the green glass of a lake. Now and again some level and masterly blast blew the multitudinous leaves up and down and then, as the wind flagged, each blade regained its identity. The flowers, burning their bright discs in the sun, flung aside the sunlight as the wind tossed them, and then some heads too heavy to rise again drooped slightly. The afternoon sun warmed the fields, poured blue into the shadows and reddened the corn. A deep varnish was laid like a lacquer over the fields. A cart, a horse, a flock of rooks, whatever moved in it was rolled round in gold. If a cow moved a leg it stirred ripples of red gold, and its horns seemed lined with light. Sprays of flaxen-haired corn lay on the hedges, brushed from the shaggy carts that came up from the meadows short-legged and prime vowel looking. The round-headed clouds never dwindled as they bowled along, but kept every atom of their rotundity. Now, as they passed, they caught a whole village in the fling of their net and, passing, let it fly free again. Far away on the horizon, among the million grains of blue-gray dust, burnt one pane, or stood the single line of one steeple or one tree. The red curtains and the white blinds blew in and out, flapping against the edge of the window, and the light which entered by flaps and breaths unequally had in it some brown tinge, and some abandonment as it blew through the blowing curtains in gusts. Here it browned a cabinet, there reddened a chair, here it made the window waver in the side of the green jar. All for a moment wavered and bent in uncertainty and ambiguity, as if a great moth sailing through the room had shadowed the immense solidity of chairs and tables with floating wings. And time, said Bernard, let's fall its drop. The drop that has formed on the roof of the soul falls. On the roof of my mind time, forming, let's fall its drop. Last week, as I stood shaving, the drop fell. I, standing with my razor in my hand, became suddenly aware of the merely habitual nature of my action. This is the drop forming, and congratulated my hands, ironically, for keeping at it. Shave, 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 I said. Go on shaving. The drop fell. All through the day's work, at intervals, my mind went to an empty place, saying, what is lost? What is over? And over and done with, I muttered, over and done with, solacing myself with words. People noticed the vacuity of my face and the aimlessness of my conversation. The last words of my sentence tailed away. And as I buttoned on my coat to go home I said more dramatically, I have lost my youth. It is curious how, at every crisis, some phrase which does not fit insists upon coming to the rescue, the penalty of living in an old civilization with a notebook. This drop falling has nothing to do with losing my youth. This drop falling is time tapering to a point. Time, which is a sunny pasture covered with a dancing light, time, which is widespread as a field at midday, becomes pendant. Time tapers to a point. As a drop falls from a glass heavy with some sediment, time falls. These are the true cycles, these are the true events. Then as if all the luminosity of the atmosphere were withdrawn I see to the bare bottom. 
I see what habit covers. I lie sluggish in bed for days. I dine out and gape like a codfish. I do not trouble to finish my sentences, and my actions, usually so uncertain, acquire a mechanical precision. On this occasion, passing an office, I went in and bought, with all the composure of a mechanical figure, a ticket for Rome. Now I sit on a stone seat in these gardens surveying the Eternal City, and the little man who was shaving in London five days ago looks already like a heap of old clothes. London has also crumbled. London consists of fallen factories and a few gasometers. At the same time I am not involved in this pageantry. I see the violet-sashed priests and the picturesque nursemaids, I notice externals only. I sit here like a convalescent, like a very simple man who knows only words of one syllable. The sun is hot, I say. The wind is cold. I feel myself carried round like an insect on top of the earth and could swear that, sitting here, I feel its hardness, its turning movement. I have no desire to go the opposite way from the earth. Could I prolong this sense another six inches I have a foreboding that I should touch some queer territory. But I have a very limited proboscis. I never wish to prolong these states of detachment, I dislike them, I also despise them. I do not wish to be a man who sits for fifty years on the same spot thinking of his navel. I wish to be harnessed to a cart, a vegetable cart that rattles over the cobbles. The truth is that I am not one of those who find their satisfaction in one person, or in infinity. The private room bores me, also the sky. My being only glitters when all its facets are exposed to many people. Let them fail and I am full of holes, dwindling like burnt paper. Oh, Mrs. Moffat, Mrs. Moffat, I say, come and sweep it all up. Things have dropped from me. I have outlived certain desires, I have lost friends, some by death, Percival, others through sheer inability to cross the street. I am not so gifted as at one time seemed likely. Certain things lie beyond my scope. I shall never understand the harder problems of philosophy. Rome is the limit of my travelling. As I drop asleep at night it strikes me sometimes with a pang that I shall never see savages in Tahiti spearing fish by the light of a blazing cresset, or a lion spring in the jungle, or a naked man eating raw flesh. Nor shall I learn Russian or read the Vedas. I shall never again walk bang into the pillar box. But still a few stars fall through my night, beautifully, from the violence of that concussion. But as I think, truth has come nearer. For many years I crooned complacently, my children, my wife, my house, my dog. As I let myself in with the latch key I would go through that familiar ritual and wrap myself in those warm coverings. Now that lovely veil has fallen. I do not want possessions now. Note, an Italian washerwoman stands on the same rung of physical refinement as the daughter of an English duke. But let me consider. The drop falls, another stage has been reached. Stage upon stage. And why should there be an end of stages? And where do they lead? To what conclusion? For they come wearing robes of solemnity. In these dilemmas the devout consult those violet-sashed and sensual-looking gentry who are trooping past me. But for ourselves, we resent teachers. Let a man get up and say, Behold, this is the truth, and instantly I perceive a sandy cat filching a piece of fish in the background. Look, you have forgotten the cat, I say. So Neville, at school, in the dim chapel, raged at the sight of the doctor's crucifix. I, who am always distracted, whether by a cat or by a bee buzzing round the bouquet that Lady Hamden keeps so diligently pressed to her nose, at once make up a story and so obliterate the angles of the crucifix. I have made up thousands of stories, I have filled innumerable notebooks with phrases to be used when I have found the true story the one story to which all these phrases refer. But I have never yet found that story. And I begin to ask, are there stories? Look now from this terrace at the swarming population beneath. Look at the general activity and clamour. That man is in difficulties with his mule. 
Half a dozen good-natured loafers offer their services. Others pass by without looking. They have as many interests as there are threads in a skein. Look at the sweep of the sky, bowled over by round white clouds. Imagine the leagues of level land and the aqueducts and the broken Roman pavement and the tombstones in the Campania, and beyond the Campania, the sea, then again more land, then the sea. I could break off any detail in all that prospect, say the mule cart, and describe it with the greatest ease. But why describe a man in trouble with his mule? Again, I could invent stories about that girl coming up the steps. She met him under the dark archway. It is over, he said, turning from the cage where the china parrot hangs. Or simply, that was all. But why impose my arbitrary design? Why stress this and shape that and twist up little figures like the toys men sell in trays in the street? Why select this, out of all that one detail? Here am I shedding one of my life skins, and all they will say is, Bernard is spending ten days in Rome. Here am I marching up and down this terrace alone, unoriented. But observe how dots and dashes are beginning, as I walk, to run themselves into continuous lines how things are losing the bald, the separate identity that they had as I walked up those steps. The great red pot is now a reddish streak in a wave of yellowish green. The world is beginning to move past me like the banks of a hedge when the train starts, like the waves of the sea when a steamer moves. I am moving to, and becoming involved in the general sequence when one thing follows another and it seems inevitable that the tree should come, then the telegraph pole, then the break in the hedge. And as I move, surrounded, included, and taking part, the usual phrases begin to bubble up, and I wish to free these bubbles from the trap door in my head, and direct my steps therefore towards that man, the back of whose head is half familiar to me. We were together at school. We shall undoubtedly meet. We shall certainly lunch together. We shall talk. But wait, one moment wait. These moments of escape are not to be despised. They come too seldom. Tahiti becomes possible. Leaning over this parapet I see far out a waste of water. A fin turns. This bare visual impression is unattached to any line of reason, it springs up as one might see the fin of a porpoise on the horizon. Visual impressions often communicate thus briefly statements that we shall in time to come uncover and coax into words. I note under F, therefore, fin in a waste of waters. I, who am perpetually making notes in the margin of my mind for some final statement, make this mark, waiting for some winter's evening. Now I shall go and lunch somewhere, I shall hold my glass up, I shall look through the wine, I shall observe with more than my usual detachment, and when a pretty woman enters the restaurant and comes down the room between the tables I shall say to myself, look where she comes against a waste of waters. A meaningless observation, but to me, solemn, slate-colored, with a fatal sound of ruining worlds and waters falling to destruction. So, Bernard, I recall you, you the usual partner in my enterprises, let us begin this new chapter, and observe the formation of this new, this unknown, strange, altogether unidentified and terrifying experience, the new drop, which is about to shape itself. Larpent is that man's name. In this hot afternoon, said Susan, here in this garden, here in this field where I walk with my son, I have reached the summit of my desires. The hinge of the gate is rusty, he heaves it open. The violent passions of childhood, my tears in the garden when Jimmy kissed Louis, my rage in the schoolroom, which smelt of pine, my loneliness in foreign places, when the mules came clattering in on their pointed hoofs and the Italian women chattered at the fountain, shawled, with carnations twisted in their hair, are rewarded by security, possession, familiarity. I have had peaceful, productive years. I possess all I see. I have grown trees from the seed. I have made ponds in which goldfish hide under the broad-leaved lilies. I have netted over strawberry beds and lettuce beds, and stitched the pears and the plums into white bags to keep them safe from the wasps. I have seen my sons and daughters, once netted over like fruit in their cots, 
break the meshes and walk with me, taller than I am, casting shadows on the grass. I am fenced in, planted here like one of my own trees. I say, my son, I say, my daughter, and even the ironmonger looking up from his counter strewn with nails, paint and wire fencing respects the shabby car at the door with its butterfly nets, pads and beehives. We hang mistletoe over the clock at Christmas, weigh our blackberries and mushrooms, count out jam pots, and stand year by year to be measured against the shutter in the drawing room window. I also make wreaths of white flowers, twisting silver-leaved plants among them for the dead, attaching my card with sorrow for the dead shepherd, with sympathy for the wife of the dead carter, and sit by the beds of dying women, who murmur their last terrors, who clutch my hand, frequenting rooms intolerable except to one born as I was an early acquainted with the farmyard and the dung heap and the hens straying in and out, and the mother with two rooms and growing children. I have seen the windows run with heat, I have smelt the sink. I ask now, standing with my scissors among my flowers, where can the shadow enter? What shock can loosen my laboriously gathered, relentlessly pressed down life? Yet sometimes I am sick of natural happiness, and fruit growing, and children scattering the house with oars, guns, skulls, books won for prizes and other trophies. I am sick of the body, I am sick of my own craft, industry, and cunning, of the unscrupulous ways of the mother who protects, who collects under her jealous eyes at one long table her own children, always her own. It is when spring comes, cold showery, with sudden yellow flowers, then as I look at the meat under the blue shade and press the heavy silver bags of tea, of sultanas, I remember how the sun rose, and the swallows skimmed the grass, and phrases that Bernard made when we were children, and the leaves shook over us, manifolded, very light, breaking the blue of the sky, scattering wandering lights upon the skeleton roots of the beech trees where I sat, sobbing. The pigeon rose. I jumped up and ran after the words that trailed like the dangling string from an air ball, up and up, from branch to branch escaping. Then like a cracked bowl the fixity of my morning broke, and putting down the bags of flour I thought, life stands round me like a glass round the imprisoned reed. I hold some scissors and snip off the hollyhocks, who went to Elverdon and trod on rotten oak apples, and saw the lady writing and the gardeners with their great brooms. We ran back panting lest we should be shot and nailed like stoats to the wall. Now I measure, I preserve. At night I sit in the armchair and stretch my arm for my sewing, and hear my husband snore, and look up when the light from a passing car dazzles the windows and feel the waves of my life tossed, broken, round me who am rooted, and hear cries, and see others' lives eddying like straws round the piers of a bridge while I push my needle in and out and draw my thread through the calico. I think sometimes of Percival who loved me. He rode and fell in India. I think sometimes of Rhoda. Uneasy cries wake me at dead of night. But for the most part one walk content with my sons. I cut the dead petals from hollyhocks. Rather squat, grey before my time, but with clear eyes, pear-shaped eyes, I pace my fields. Here I stand, said Ginny in the tube station where everything that is desirable meets Piccadilly South Side, Piccadilly North Side, Regent Street and the Haymarket. I stand for a moment under the pavement in the heart of London. Innumerable wheels rush and feet press just over my head. The great avenues of civilization meet here and strike this way and that. I am in the heart of life. But look, there is my body in that looking glass. How solitary, how shrunk, how aged? I am no longer young. I am no longer part of the procession. Millions descend those stairs in a terrible descent. Great wheels churn inexorably urging them downwards. Millions have died. Percival died. I still move. I still live. But who will come if I signal? Little animal that I am, sucking my flanks in and out with fear, I stand here, palpitating, trembling. But I will not be afraid. I will bring the whip down on my flanks. I am not a whimpering little animal making for the shadow. 
It was only for a moment, catching sight of myself before I had time to prepare myself as I always prepare myself for the sight of myself, that I quailed. It is true, I am not young, I shall soon raise my arm in vain and my scarf will fall to my side without having signalled. I shall not hear the sudden sigh in the night and feel through the dark someone coming. There will be no reflections in window panes in dark tunnels. I shall look into faces, and I shall see them seek some other face. I admit for one moment the soundless flight of upright bodies down the moving stairs like the pinioned and terrible descent of some army of the dead downwards and the churning of the great engines remorselessly forwarding us, all of us, onwards, made me cower and run for shelter. But now I swear, making deliberately in front of the glass those slight preparations that equip me, I will not be afraid. Think of the superb omnibuses, red and yellow, stopping and starting, punctually in order. Think of the powerful and beautiful cars that now slow to a foot's pace and now shoot forward, think of men, think of women, equipped, prepared, driving onward. This is the triumphant procession. This is the army of victory with banners and brass eagles and heads crowned with laurel leaves won in battle. They are better than savages in loincloths, and women whose hair is dank, whose long breasts sag, with children tugging at their long breasts. These broad thoroughfares, Piccadilly South, Piccadilly North, Regent Street and the Haymarket are sanded paths of victory driven through the jungle. I too, with my little patent leather shoes, my handkerchief that is but a film of gauze, my reddened lips and my finely penciled eyebrows, march to victory with the band. Look how they show off clothes here even underground in a perpetual radiance. They will not let the earth even lie wormy and sodden. There are gauzes and silks illumined in glass cases and underclothes trimmed with a million close stitches of fine embroidery. Crimson, green, violet, they are dyed all colours. Think how they organise, roll out, smooth, dip in dyes, and drive tunnels blasting the rock. Lifts rise and fall, trains stop, trams start as regularly as the waves of the sea. This is what has my adhesion. I am a native of this world, I follow its banners. How could I run for shelter when they are so magnificently adventurous, daring, curious, too? and strong enough in the midst of effort to pause and scrawl with a free-handed joke upon the wall. Therefore I will powder my face and redden my lips. I will make the angle of my eyebrows sharper than usual. I will rise to the surface, standing erect with the others in Piccadilly Circus. I will sign with a sharp gesture to a cab whose driver will signify by some indescribable alacrity his understanding of my signals. For I still excite eagerness. I still feel the bowing of men in the street like the silent stoop of the corn when the light wind blows, ruffling it red. I will drive to my own house. I will fill the vases with lavish, with luxurious, with extravagant flowers nodding in great bunches. I will place one chair there, another here. I will put ready cigarettes, glasses and some gaily covered new unread book in case Bernard comes, or Neville or Louis. But perhaps it will not be Bernard. Neville or Louis, but somebody new, somebody unknown, somebody I passed on a staircase and, just turning as we passed, I murmured, come. He will come this afternoon, somebody I do not know, somebody new. Let the silent army of the dead descend. I march forward. I no longer need a room now, said Neville, or walls and firelight. I am no longer young. I pass Ginny's house without envy, and smile at the young man who arranges his tie a little nervously on the doorstep. Let the dapper young man ring the bell, let him find her. I shall find her if I want her, if not, I pass on. The old corrosion has lost its bite envy, intrigue and bitterness have been washed out. We have lost our glory too. When we were young we sat anywhere, on bare benches in drafty halls with the doors always banging. We tumbled about half-naked like boys on the deck of a ship squirting each other with hose pipes. Now I could swear that I like people pouring profusely out of the tube when the day's work is done, unanimous, indiscriminate, uncounted. I have picked my own fruit. I look dispassionately. After all, 
we are not responsible. We are not judges. We are not called upon to torture our fellows with thumbscrews and irons, we are not called upon to mount pulpits and lecture them on pale Sunday afternoons. It is better to look at a rose, or to read Shakespeare as I read him here in Shaftesbury Avenue. Here's the fool, here's the villain, here in a car comes Cleopatra, burning on her barge. Here are figures of the dam too, noseless men by the police court wall, standing with their feet in fire, howling. This is poetry if we do not write it. They act their parts infallibly, and almost before they open their lips I know what they are going to say, and wait the divine moment when they speak the word that must have been written. If it were only for the sake of the play, I could walk Shaftesbury Avenue forever. Then coming from the street, entering some room, there are people talking, or hardly troubling to talk. He says, she says, somebody else says things have been said so often that one word is now enough to lift a whole weight. Argument, laughter, old grievances, they fall through the air, thickening it. I take a book and read half a page of anything. They have not mended the spout of the teapot yet. The child dances, dressed in her mother's clothes. But then Rhoda, or it may be Louis, some fasting and anguished spirit, passes through and out again. They want a plot, do they? They want a reason? It is not enough for them, this ordinary scene. It is not enough to wait for the thing to be said as if it were written, to see the sentence lay its dab of clay precisely on the right place, making character, to perceive, suddenly, some group in outline against the sky. Yet if they want violence, I have seen death and murder and suicide all in one room. One comes in, one goes out. There are sobs on the staircase. I have heard threads broken and knots tied and the quiet stitching of white cambric going on and on on the knees of a woman. Why ask, like Louis, for a reason, or fly like Rhoda to some far grove and part the leaves of the laurels and look for statues? They say that one must beat one's wings against the storm in the belief that beyond this welter the sun shines, the sun falls sheer into pools that are fledged with willows. Here it is November, the poor hold out matchboxes in wind-bitten fingers. They say truth is to be found there entire, and virtue, that shuffles along here, down blind alleys, is to be had there perfect. Rhoda flies with her neck outstretched and blind fanatic eyes, past us. Louis, now so opulent, goes to his attic window among the blistered roofs and gazes where she has vanished, but must sit down in his office among the typewriters and the telephone and work it all out for our instruction, for our regeneration, and the reform of an unborn world. But now in this room, which I enter without knocking, things are said as if they had been written. I go to the bookcase. If I choose, I read half a page of anything. I need not speak. But I listen. I am marvelously on the alert. Certainly, one cannot read this poem without effort. The page is often corrupt and mud-stained, and torn and stuck together with faded leaves, with scraps of verbena or geranium. To read this poem one must have myriad eyes, like one of those lamps that turn on slabs of racing water at midnight in the Atlantic, when perhaps only a spray of seaweed pricks the surface, or suddenly the waves gape and up shoulders a monster. One must put aside antipathies and jealousies and not interrupt. One must have patience and infinite care and let the light sound, whether of spiders' delicate feet on a leaf or the chuckle of water in some irrelevant drainpipe, unfold too. Nothing is to be rejected in fear or horror. The poet who has written this page, what I read with people talking, has withdrawn. There are no commas or semicolons. The lines do not run in convenient lengths. Much is sheer nonsense. One must be skeptical, but throw caution to the winds and when the door opens accept absolutely. Also sometimes weep, also cut away ruthlessly with a slice of the blade soot, bark, hard accretions of all sorts. And so, while they talk, let down one's net deeper and deeper and gently draw in and bring to the surface what he said and she said and make poetry. Now I have listened to them talking. They have gone now. I am alone. I could be content to watch the fire burn forever, like a dome, like a furnace, 
Now some spike of wood takes the look of a scaffold, or pit, or happy valley. Now it is a serpent curled crimson with white scales. The fruit on the curtain swells beneath the parrot's beak. Cheep, cheep, creaks the fire, like the cheep of insects in the middle of a forest. Cheep, cheep, it clicks while out there the branches thrash the air, and now, like a volley of shot, a tree falls. These are the sounds of a London night. Then I hear the one sound I wait for. Up and up it comes, approaches, hesitates, stops at my door. I cry, come in. Sit by me. Sit on the edge of the chair. Swept away by the old hallucination, I cry, come closer, closer dot. I come back from the office, said Louis. I hang my coat here, place my stick there I like to fancy that Richelieu walked with such a cane. Thus I divest myself of my authority. I have been sitting at the right hand of a director at a varnished table. The maps of our successful undertakings confront us on the wall. We have laced the world together with our ships. The globe is strung with our lines. I am immensely respectable. All the young ladies in the office acknowledge my entrance. I can dine where I like now, and without vanity may suppose that I shall soon acquire a house in Surrey two cars, a conservatory, and some rare species of melon. But I still return, I still come back to my attic, hang up my hat and resume in solitude that curious attempt which I have made since I brought down my fist on my master's grained oak door. I open a little book. I read one poem. One poem is enough. O oh, Western Wind O oh, western wind, you are at enmity with my mahogany table and spats, and also, alas, with the vulgarity of my mistress, the little actress, who has never been able to speak English correctly. O oh, western wind, when wilt thou blow? Rhoda, with her intense abstraction, with her unseeing eyes the colour of snail's flesh, does not destroy you, western wind, whether she comes at midnight when the stars blaze or at the most prosaic hour of midday. She stands at the window and looks at the chimney pots and the broken windows in the houses of poor people. O oh, western wind, when wilt thou blow? My task, my burden, has always been greater than other people's. A pyramid has been set on my shoulders. I have tried to do a colossal labor. I have driven a violent, an unruly, a vicious team. With my Australian accent I have sat in eating shops and tried to make the clerks accept me, yet never forgotten my solemn and severe convictions and the discrepancies and incoherences that must be resolved. As a boy I dreamt of the Nile, was reluctant to awake, yet brought down my fist on the grained oak door. It would have been happier to have been born without a destiny, like Susan, like Percival, whom I most admire. O oh, western wind, when wilt thou blow? that the small rain down can rain? Life has been a terrible affair for me. I am like some vast sucker, some glutinous, some adhesive, some insatiable mouth. I have tried to draw from the living flesh the stone lodged at the center. I have known little natural happiness, thought I chose my mistress in order that, with her cockney accent, she might make me feel at my ease. But she only tumbled the floor with dirty underlinen, and the charwoman and the shop boys called after me a dozen times a day, mocking my prim and supercilious gait. O oh, western wind, when wilt thou blow, that the small rain down can rain? What has my destiny been, the sharp-pointed pyramid that has pressed on my ribs all these years? That I remember the Nile and the women carrying pitchers on their heads, that I feel myself woven in and out of the long summers and winters that have made the corn flow and have frozen the streams. I am not a single and passing being. My life is not a moment's bright spark like that on the surface of a diamond. I go beneath ground tortuously, as if a warder carried a lamp from cell to cell. My destiny has been that I remember and must weave together, must plait into one cable the many threads, the thin, the thick, the broken, the enduring of our long history, of our tumultuous and varied day. There is always more to be understood, a discord to be listened for a falsity to be reprimanded. Broken and soot-stained are these roofs with their chimney cowls, their loose slates, their slinking cats and attic windows. 
I pick my way over broken glass, among blistered tiles, and see only vile and famished faces. Let us suppose that I make reason of it all, one poem on a page, and then die. I can assure you it will not be unwillingly. Percival died. Rhoda left me. But I shall live to be gaunt and sere, to tap my way, much respected, with my gold-headed cane along the pavements of the city. Perhaps I shall never die, shall never attain even that continuity and permanence. O western wind, when wilt thou blow, that the small rain down can rain? Percival was flowering with green leaves and was laid in the earth with all his branches still sighing in the summer wind. Rhoda, with whom I shared silence when the other spoke, she who hung back and turned aside when the herd assembled and galloped with orderly, sleek backs over the rich pastures, has gone now like the desert heat. When the sun blisters the roofs of the city I think of her, when the dry leaves patter to the ground, when the old men come with pointed sticks and pierce little bits of paper as we pierced her. O western wind, when wilt thou blow, that the small rain down can rain? Christ, that my love were in my arms, and I in my bed again. I return now to my book, I return now to my attempt. Oh, life, how I have dreaded you, said Rhoda, oh, human beings, how I have hated you. How you have nudged, how you have interrupted, how hideous you have looked in Oxford Street, how squalid sitting opposite each other staring in the tube. Now as I climb this mountain, from the top of which I shall see Africa, my mind is printed with brown paper parcels and your faces. I have been stained by you and corrupted. You smelt so unpleasant too, lining up outside doors to buy tickets. All were dressed in indeterminate shades of grey and brown, never even a blue feather pinned to a hat. None had the courage to be one thing rather than another. What dissolution of the soul you demanded in order to get through one day, what lies, bowings, scrapings, fluency and servility. How you chained me to one spot, one hour, one chair, and sat yourselves down opposite. How you snatched from me the white spaces that lie between our and our and rolled them into dirty pellets and tossed them into the waste paper basket with your greasy paws. Yet those were my life. But I yielded. Sneers and yawns were covered with my hand. I did not go out into the street and break a bottle in the gutter as a sign of rage. Trembling with ardor, I pretended that I was not surprised. What you did, I did. If Susan and Jimmy pulled up their stockings like that, I pulled mine up like that also. So terrible was life that I held up shade after shade. Look at life through this, look at life through that, let there be rose leaves, let there be vine leaves, I covered the whole street, Oxford Street, Piccadilly Circus, with the blaze and ripple of my mind, with vine leaves and rose leaves. There were boxes too, standing in the passage when the school broke up. I stole secretly to read the labels and dream of names and faces. Harrogate, perhaps, Edinburgh, perhaps, was ruffled with golden glory where some girl whose name I forget stood on the pavement. But it was the name only. I left Louis, I feared embraces. With fleeces, with vestments, I have tried to cover the blue-black blade. I implored day to break into night. I have longed to see the cupboard dwindle, to feel the bed soften, to float suspended, to perceive lengthened trees, lengthened faces, a green bank on a moor and two figures in distress saying goodbye. I flung words in fans like those the sower throws over the ploughed fields when the earth is bare. I desired always to stretch the night and fill it fuller and fuller with dreams. Then in some hall I parted the boughs of music and saw the house we have made, the square stood upon the oblong. The house which contains all, I said, lurching against people's shoulders in an omnibus after Percival died, yet I went to Greenwich. Walking on the embankment, I prayed that I might thunder forever on the verge of the world where there is no vegetation, but here and there a marble pillar. I threw my bunch into the spreading wave. I said, consume me, carry me to the furthest limit. The wave has broken, the bunch is withered. I seldom think of Percival now. Now I climb this Spanish hill, and I will suppose that this mule back is my bed and that I lie dying. 
There is only a thin sheet between me now and the infinite depths. The lumps in the mattress soften beneath me. We stumble up, we stumble on. My path has been up and up, towards some solitary tree with a pool beside it on the very top. I have sliced the waters of beauty in the evening when the hills close themselves like birds' wings folded. I have picked sometimes a red carnation, and wisps of hay. I have sunk alone on the turf and fingered some old bone and thought, when the wind stoops to brush this height, may there be nothing found but a pinch of dust. The mule stumbles up and on. The ridge of the hill rises like mist, but from the top I shall see Africa. Now the bed gives under me. The sheet spotted with yellow holes let me fall through. The good woman with a face like a white horse at the end of the bed makes a valedictory movement and turns to go. Who then comes with me? Flowers only, the cowbind and the moonlight coloured may. Gathering them loosely in a sheaf I made of them a garland and gave them, oh, to whom? We launch out now over the precipice. Beneath us lie the lights of the herring fleet. The cliffs vanish. Rippling small, rippling grey, innumerable waves spread beneath us. I touch nothing. I see nothing. We may sink and settle on the waves. The sea will drum in my ears. The white petals will be darkened with sea water. They will float for a moment and then sink. Rolling me over the waves will shoulder me under. Everything falls in a tremendous shower, dissolving me. Yet that tree has bristling branches, that is the hard line of a cottage roof. Those bladder shapes painted red and yellow are faces. Putting my foot to the ground I step gingerly and press my hand against the hard door of a Spanish inn. The sun was sinking. The hard stone of the day was cracked and light poured through its splinters. Red and gold shot through the waves, in rapid running arrows, feathered with darkness. Erratically rays of light flashed and wandered, like signals from sunken islands, or darts shot through laurel groves by shameless, laughing boys. But the waves, as they neared the shore, were robbed of light, and fell in one long concussion, like a wall falling, a wall of grey stone, unpierced by any chink of light. A breeze rose, a shiver ran through the leaves, and thus stirred they lost their brown density and became grey or white as the tree shifted its mass, winked and lost its domed uniformity. The hawk poised on the topmost branch flicked its eyelids and rose and sailed and soared far away. The wild plover cried in the marshes, evading, circling, and crying further off in loneliness. The smoke of trains and chimneys was stretched and torn and became part of the fleecy canopy that hung over the sea and the fields. Now the corn was cut. Now only a brisk stubble was left of all its flowing and waving. Slowly a great owl launched itself from the elm tree and swung and rose, as if on a line that dipped, to the height of the cedar. On the hills the slow shadows now broadened, now shrank, as they passed over. The pool on the top of the moor looked blank. No furry face looked there, or hoof splashed, or hot muzzle seethed in the water. A bird, perched on an ash-coloured twig, sipped a beak full of cold water. There was no sound of cropping and no sound of wheels, but only the sudden roar of the wind letting its sails fill and brushing the tops of the grasses. One bone lay rain-pocked and sun-bleached till it shone like a twig that the sea has polished. The tree, that had burnt foxy red in spring and in midsummer bent pliant leaves to the south wind, was now black as iron, and as bare. The land was so distant that no shining roof or glittering window could be any longer seen. The tremendous weight of the shadowed earth had engulfed such frail fetters, such snail-shell encumbrances. Now there was only the liquid shadow of the cloud, the buffeting of the rain, a single darting spear of sunshine, or the sudden bruise of the rainstorm. Solitary trees mark distant hills like obelisks. The evening sun, whose heat had gone out of it and whose burning spot of intensity had been diffused, made chairs and tables mellower and inlaid them with lozenges of brown and yellow. Lined with shadows their weight seemed more ponderous, as if colour, tilted, had run to one side. Here lay knife, fork and glass, but lengthened, swollen, and made portentous. 
Rimmed in a gold circle the looking glass held the scene immobile as if everlasting in its eye. Meanwhile the shadows lengthened on the beach, the blackness deepened. The iron black boot became a pool of deep blue. The rocks lost their hardness. The water that stood round the old boat was dark as if mussels had been steeped in it. The foam had turned livid and left here and there a white gleam of pearl on the misty sand. Hampton Court, said Bernard. Hampton Court. This is our meeting place. Behold the red chimneys, the square battlements of Hampton Court. The tone of my voice as I say Hampton Court proves that I am middle-aged. Ten years, fifteen years ago, I should have said Hampton Court, with interrogation, what will it be like? Will there be lakes, mazes? Or with anticipation, what is going to happen to me here? Whom shall I meet? Now, Hampton Court, Hampton Court, the words beat a gong in the space which I have so laboriously cleared with half a dozen telephone messages and postcards, give off ring after ring of sound, booming, sonorous, and pictures rise, summer afternoons, boats, old ladies holding their skirts up, one urn in winter, some daffodils in March, these all float to the top of the waters that now lie deep on every scene. They're at the door by the inn, our meeting place, they are already standing, Susan, Louis, Rhoda, Ginny and Neville. They have come together already. In a moment, when I have joined them, another arrangement will form, another pattern. What now runs to waste, forming scenes profusely, will be checked, stated. I am reluctant to suffer that compulsion. Already at fifty yards distance I feel the order of my being changed. The tug of the magnet of their society tells upon me. I come nearer. They do not see me. Now Rhoda sees me, but she pretends, with her horror of the shock of meeting, that I am a stranger. Now Neville turns. Suddenly, raising my hand, saluting Neville I cry, I too have pressed flowers between the pages of Shakespeare's sonnets, and am churned up. My little boat bobs unsteadily upon the chopped and tossing waves. There is no panacea, let me note, against the shock of meeting. It is uncomfortable too, joining ragged edges, raw edges, only gradually, as we shuffle and trample into the inn, taking coats and hats off, does meeting become agreeable. Now we assemble in the long, bare dining room that overlooks some park, some green space still fantastically lit by the setting sun so that there is a gold bar between the trees, and sit ourselves down. Now sitting side by side, said Neville, at this narrow table, now before the first emotion is worn smooth, what do we feel? Honestly now, openly and directly as befits old friends meeting with difficulty, what do we feel on meeting? Sorrow. The door will not open, he will not come. And we are laden. Being now all of us middle-aged, loads are on us. Let us put down our loads. What have you made of life, we ask, and I? You, Bernard, you, Susan, you, Ginny, and Rhoda and Louis. The lists have been posted on the doors. Before we break these rolls, and help ourselves to fish and salad, I feel in my private pocket and find my credentials, what I carry to prove my superiority. I have passed. I have papers in my private pocket that prove it. But your eyes, Susan, full of turnips and cornfields, disturb me. These papers in my private pocket, the clamour that proves that I have passed, make a faint sound like that of a man clapping in an empty field to scare away rooks. Now it has died down altogether, under Susan's stare, the clapping, the reverberation that I have made, and I hear only the wind sweeping over the ploughed land and some birds singing, perhaps some intoxicated lark. Has the waiter heard of me? or those furtive everlasting couples, now loitering, now holding back and looking at the trees which are not yet dark enough to shelter their prostrate bodies. No, the sound of clapping has failed. What then remains, when I cannot pull out my papers and make you believe by reading aloud my credentials that I have passed? What remains is what Susan brings to light under the acid of her green eyes, her crystal, pear-shaped eyes. There is always somebody, when we come together, and the edges of meeting are still sharp, who refuses to be submerged, 
whose identity therefore one wishes to make crouch beneath one's own. For me now, it is Susan. I talk to impress Susan. Listen to me, Susan. When someone comes in at breakfast, even the embroidered fruit on my curtain swells so that parrots can peck it, one can break it off between one's thumb and finger. The thin, skimmed milk of early morning turns opal, blue, rose. At that hour your husband, the man who slapped his gaiters, pointing with his whip at the barren cow, grumbles. You say nothing. You see nothing. Custom blinds your eyes. At that hour your relationship is mute, null, dun-colored. Mine at that hour is warm and various. There are no repetitions for me. Each day is dangerous. Smooth on the surface, we are all bone beneath like snakes coiling. Suppose we read the times, suppose we argue. It is an experience. Suppose it is winter. The snow falling loads down the roof and seals us together in a red cave. The pipes have burst. We stand a yellow tin bath in the middle of the room. We rush helter-skelter for basins. Look there it has burst again over the bookcase. We shout with laughter at the sight of ruin. Let solidity be destroyed. Let us have no possessions. Or is it summer? We may wander to a lake and watch Chinese geese waddling flat-footed to the water's edge or see a bone-like city church with young green trembling before it. I choose at random, I choose the obvious. Each sight is an arabesque scrawled suddenly to illustrate some hazard and marvel of intimacy. The snow, the burst pipe, the tin bath, the Chinese goose, these are signs swung high aloft upon which, looking back, I read the character of each love, how each was different. You meanwhile, for I want to diminish your hostility, your green eyes fixed on mine, and your shabby dress, your rough hands, and all the other emblems of your maternal splendor, have stuck like a limpet to the same rock. Yet it is true, I do not want to hurt you, only to refresh and furbish up my own belief in myself that failed at your entry. Change is no longer possible. We are committed. Before, when we met in a restaurant in London with Percival, all simmered and shook, we could have been anything. We have chosen now, or sometimes it seems the choice was made for us, a pair of tongs pinched us between the shoulders. I chose. I took the print of life not outwardly, but inwardly upon the raw, the white, the unprotected fibre. I am clouded and bruised with the print of minds and faces and things so subtle that they have smell, colour, texture, substance, but no name. I am merely Neville to you, who see the narrow limits of my life and the line it cannot pass. But to myself I am immeasurable, a net whose fibres pass imperceptibly beneath the world. My net is almost indistinguishable from that which it surrounds. It lifts whales, huge leviathans and white jellies, what is amorphous and wandering, I detect, I perceive. Beneath my eyes opens a book, I see to the bottom, the heart I see to the depths. I know what loves are trembling into fire, how jealousy shoots its green flushes hither and thither, how intricately love crosses love, love makes knots, love brutally tears them apart. I have been knotted, I have been torn apart. But there was another glory once, when we watched for the door to open, and Percival came, when we flung ourselves unattached on the edge of a hard bench in a public room. There was the beechwood, said Susan, Elverdon, and the gilt hands of the clock sparkling among the trees. The pigeons broke the leaves. The changing travelling lights wandered over me. They escaped me. Yet look, Neville, whom I discredit in order to be myself, at my hand on the table. Look at the gradations of healthy colour here on the knuckles, here on the palm. My body has been used daily, rightly, like a tool by a good workman, all over. The blade is clean, sharp, worn in the centre. We battle together like beasts fighting in a field, like stags making their horns clash. Seen through your pale and yielding flesh, even apples and bunches of fruit must have a filmed look as if they stood under glass. Lying deep in a chair with one person, one person only, but one person who changes, 
you see one inch of flesh only, its nerves, fibers, the sullen or quick flow of blood on it, but nothing entire. You do not see a house in a garden, a horse in a field, a town laid out, as you bend like an old woman straining her eyes over her darning. But I have seen life in blocks, substantial, huge, its battlements and towers, factories, and gasometers, a dwelling place made from time immemorial after an hereditary pattern. These things remain square, prominent, undissolved in my mind. I am not sinuous or suave, I sit among you abrading your softness with my hardness, quenching the silver-grey flickering moth-wing quiver of words with the green spurt of my clear eyes. Now we have clashed our antlers. This is the necessary prelude, the salute of old friends. The gold has faded between the trees, said Rhoda, and a slice of green lies behind them, elongated like the blade of a knife seen in dreams, or some tapering island on which nobody sets foot. Now the cars begin to wink and flicker, coming down the avenue. Lovers can draw into the darkness now, the boles of the trees are swollen, are obscene with lovers. It was different once, said Bernard. Once we could break the current as we chose. How many telephone calls, how many postcards, are now needed to cut this hole through which we come together, united, at Hampton Court? How swift life runs from January to December. We are all swept on by the torrent of things grown so familiar that they cast no shade, we make no comparisons, think scarcely ever of I or of you, and in this unconsciousness attain the utmost freedom from friction and part the weeds that grow over the mouths of sunken channels. We have to leap like fish, high in the air, in order to catch the train from Waterloo. And however high we leap we fall back again into the stream. I shall never now take ship for the South Sea Islands. A journey to Rome is the limit of my travelling. I have sons and daughters. I am wedged into my place in the puzzle. But it is only my body, this elderly man here whom you call Bernard, that is fixed irrevocably, so I desire to believe. I think more disinterestedly than I could when I was young and must dig furiously like a child rummaging in a bran pie to discover myself. Look, what is this? And this? Is this going to be a fine present? Is that all, and so on? Now I know what the parcels hold, and do not care much. I throw my mind out in the air as a man throws seeds in great fan flights, falling through the purple sunset, falling on the pressed and shining plowland which is bare. A phrase. An imperfect phrase. And what are phrases? They have left me very little to lay on the table, beside Susan's hand, to take from my pocket, with Neville's credentials. I am not an authority on law, or medicine, or finance. I am wrapped round with phrases, like damp straw, I glow, phosphorescent. And each of you feels when I speak, I am lit up. I am glowing. The little boys used to feel that's a good one, that's a good one, as the phrases bubbled up from my lips under the elm trees in the playing fields. They too bubbled up, they also escaped with my phrases. But I pine in solitude. Solitude is my undoing. I pass from house to house like the friars in the Middle Ages who cousined the wives and girls with beads and ballads. I am a traveller, a peddler, paying for my lodging with a ballad, I am an indiscriminate, an easily pleased guest, often putting up in the best room in a four-poster, then lying in a barn on a haystack. I don't mind the fleas and find no fault with silk either. I am very tolerant. I am not a moralist. I have too great a sense of the shortness of life and its temptations to rule red lines. Yet I am not so indiscriminate as you think, judging me, as you judge me, from my fluency. I have a little dagger of contempt and severity hidden up my sleeve. But I am apt to be deflected. I make stories. I twist up toys out of anything. A girl sits at a cottage door, she is waiting, for whom? Seduced, or not seduced? The headmaster sees the hole in the carpet. He sighs. His wife, drawing her fingers through the waves of her still abundant hair, reflects, etc. 
waves of hands, hesitations at street corners, someone dropping a cigarette into the gutter, all our stories. But which is the true story? That I do not know. Hence I keep my phrases hung like clothes in a cupboard, waiting for someone to wear them. Thus waiting, thus speculating, making this note and then another, I do not cling to life. I shall be brushed like a bee from a sunflower. My philosophy, always accumulating, welling up moment by moment, runs like quicksilver a dozen ways at once. But Louis, wild-eyed but severe, in his attic, in his office, has formed unalterable conclusions upon the true nature of what is to be known. It breaks, said Louis, the thread I try to spin, your laughter breaks it, your indifference, also your beauty. Jimmy broke the thread when she kissed me in the garden years ago. The boasting boys mocked me at school for my Australian accent and broke it. This is the meaning, I say, and then start with a pang vanity. Listen, I say, to the nightingale, who sings among the trampling feet, the conquests and migrations. Believe and then am twitched asunder. Over broken tiles and splinters of glass I pick my way. Different lights fall, making the ordinary leopard spotted and strange. This moment of reconciliation, when we meet together united, this evening moment, with its wine and shaking leaves, and youth coming up from the river in white flannels, carrying cushions, is to me black with the shadows of dungeons and the tortures and infamies practiced by man upon man. So imperfect are my senses that they never blot out with one purple the serious charge that my reason adds and adds against us, even as we sit here. What is the solution, I ask myself, and the bridge? How can I reduce these dazzling, these dancing apparitions to one line capable of linking all in one? So I ponder, and you meanwhile observe maliciously my pursed lips, my sallow cheeks and my invariable frown. But I beg you also to notice my cane and my waistcoat. I have inherited a desk of solid mahogany in a room hung with maps. Our steamers have won an enviable reputation for their cabins replete with luxury. We supply swimming baths and gymnasiums. I wear a white waistcoat now and consult a little book before I make an engagement. This is the arch and ironical manner in which I hope to distract you from my shivering, my tender, and infinitely young and unprotected soul. For I am always the youngest, the most naively surprised, the one who runs in advance in apprehension and sympathy with discomfort or ridicule should there be a smut on a nose, or a button undone. I suffer for all humiliations. Yet I am also ruthless, memorial. I do not see how you can say that it is fortunate to have lived. Your little excitements, your childish transports, when a kettle boils, when the soft air lifts Ginny's spotted scarf and it floats web-like, are to me like silk streamers thrown in the eyes of the charging bull. I condemn you. Yet my heart yearns towards you. I would go with you through the fires of death. Yet am happiest alone. I luxuriate in gold and purple vestments. Yet I prefer a view over chimneypots, cats scraping their mangy sides upon blistered chimney stacks, broken windows, and the hoarse clangor of bells from the steeple of some brick chapel. I see what is before me, said Ginny. This scarf, these wine-colored spots. This glass. This mustard pot. This flower. I like what one touches, what one tastes. I like rain when it has turned to snow and become palatable. And being rash, and much more courageous than you are, I do not temper my beauty with meanness lest it should scorch me. I gulp it down entire. It is made of flesh, it is made of stuff. My imagination is the body's. Its visions are not fine spun and white with purity like Louis. I do not like your lean cats and your blistered chimney pots. The scrannel beauties of your rooftops repel me. Men and women, in uniforms, wigs and gowns, bowler hats and tennis shirts beautifully open at the neck, the infinite variety of women's dresses, I note all clothes always, delight me. I eddy with them, in and out, in and out, into rooms, into halls, here, there, everywhere, wherever they go. This man lifts the hoof of a horse.
This man shoves in and out the drawers of his private collection. I am never alone. I am attended by a regiment of my fellows. My mother must have followed the drum, my father the sea. I am like a little dog that trots down the road after the regimental band, but stops to snuff a tree trunk, to sniff some brown stain, and suddenly careers across the street after some mongrel cur and then holds one paw up while it sniffs an entrancing whiff of meat from the butcher's shop. My traffics have led me into strange places. Men, how many, have broken from the wall and come to me. I have only to hold my hand up. Straight as a dart they have come to the place of assignation, perhaps a chair on a balcony, perhaps a shop at a street corner. The torments, the divisions of your lives have been solved for me night after night, sometimes only by the touch of a finger under the tablecloth as we sat dining, so fluid has my body become, forming even at the touch of a finger into one full drop, which fills itself, which quivers, which flashes, which falls in ecstasy. I have sat before a looking glass as you sit writing, adding up figures at desks. So, before the looking glass in the temple of my bedroom, I have judged my nose and my chin, my lips that open too wide and show too much gum. I have looked. I have noted. I have chosen what yellow or white, what shine or dullness, what loop or straightness suits. I am volatile for one, rigid for another, angular as an icicle in silver, or voluptuous as a candle flame in gold. I have run violently like a whip flung out to the extreme end of my tether. His shirt front, there in the corner, has been white, then purple, smoke and flame have wrapped us about, after a furious conflagration yet we scarcely raised our voices, sitting on the hearthrug, as we murmured all the secrets of our hearts as into shells so that nobody might hear in the sleeping house, but I heard the cook stir once, and once we thought the ticking of the clock was a footfall, we have sunk to ashes, leaving no relics, no unburnt bones, no wisps of hair to be kept in. Lock it such as your intimacies leave behind them. Now I turn grey, now I turn gaunt, but I look at my face at midday sitting in front of the looking glass in broad daylight, and note precisely my nose, my chin, my lips that open too wide and show too much gum. But I am not afraid. There were lampposts, said Rhoda, and trees that had not yet shed their leaves on the way from the station. The leaves might have hidden me still. But I did not hide behind them. I walked straight up to you instead of circling round to avoid the shock of sensation as I used. But it is only that I have taught my body to do a certain trick. Inwardly I am not taught, I fear, I hate, I love, I envy and despise you, but I never join you happily. Coming up from the station, refusing to accept the shadow of the trees and the pillar boxes, I perceived, from your coats and umbrellas, even at a distance, how you stand embedded in a substance made of repeated moments run together, are committed, have an attitude, with children, authority, fame, love, society, where I have nothing. I have no face. Here in this dining room you see the antlers and the tumblers, the salt cellars, the yellow stains on the tablecloth. Waiter, says Bernard. Bread, says Susan. And the waiter comes, he brings bread. But I see the side of a cup like a mountain and only parts of antlers, and the brightness on the side of that jug like a crack in darkness with wonder and terror. Your voices sound like trees creaking in a forest. So with your faces and their prominences and hollows. How beautiful, standing at a distance immobile at midnight against the railings of some square. Behind you is a white crescent of foam, and fishermen on the verge of the world are drawing in nets and casting them. A wind ruffles the topmost leaves of prime val trees. Yet here we sit at Hampton Court. Parrots shrieking break the intense stillness of the jungle. Here the trams start. The swallow dips her wings in midnight pools. Here we talk. That is the circumference that I try to grasp as we sit together. Thus I must undergo the penance of Hampton Court at 7.30 precisely. But since these rolls of bread and wine bottles are needed by me, 
and your faces with their hollows and prominences are beautiful, and the tablecloth and its yellow stain, far from being allowed to spread in wider and wider circles of understanding that may at last, so I dream, falling off the edge of the earth at night when my bed floats suspended, embrace the entire world, I must go through the antics of the individual. I must start when you pluck at me with your children, your poems, your chilblains, or whatever it is that you do and suffer. But I am not deluded. After all these callings hither and thither, these pluckings and searchings, I shall fall alone through this thin sheet into gulfs of fire. And you will not help me. More cruel than the old torturers, you will let me fall, and will tear me to pieces when I am fallen. Yet there are moments when the walls of the mind grow thin, when nothing is unabsorbed, and I could fancy that we might blow so vast a bubble that the sun might set and rise in it and we might take the blue of midday and the black of midnight and be cast off and escape from here and now. Drop upon drop, said Bernard, silence falls. It forms on the roof of the mind and falls into pools beneath. Forever alone, 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 here silence fall and sweep its rings to the farthest edges. Gorged and replete, solid with middle-aged content, I, whom loneliness destroys, let silence fall, drop by drop. But now silence falling pits my face, wastes my nose like a snowman stood out in a yard in the rain. As silence falls I am dissolved utterly and become featureless and scarcely to be distinguished from another. It does not matter. What matters? We have dined well. The fish, the veal cutlets, the wine have blunted the sharp tooth of egotism. Anxiety is at rest. The vainest of us, Louis perhaps, does not care what people think. Neville's tortures are at rest. Let others prosper, that is what he thinks. Susan hears the breathing of all her children safe asleep. Sleep, sleep, she murmurs. Rhoda has rocked her ships to shore. Whether they have foundered, whether they have anchored, she cares no longer. We are ready to consider any suggestion that the world may offer quite impartially. I reflect now that the earth is only a pebble flicked off accidentally from the face of the sun and that there is no life anywhere in the abysses of space. In this silence, said Susan, it seems as if no leaf would ever fall, or bird fly. As if the miracle had happened, said Ginny, and life was stayed here and now. And, said Rhoda, we had no more to live. But listen, said Louis, to the world moving through abysses of infinite space. It roars, the lighted strip of history is past and our kings and queens, we are gone our civilization, the Nile, and all life. Our separate drops are dissolved, we are extinct, lost in the abysses of time, in the darkness. Silence falls, silence falls, said Bernard. But now listen, tick, tick, hoot, hoot, the world has hailed us back to it. I heard for one moment the howling winds of darkness as we passed beyond life. Then tick, tick, the clock, then hoot, hoot, the cars. We are landed, we are on shore, we are sitting, six of us, at a table. It is the memory of my nose that recalls me. I rise, fight, I cry, fight, remembering the shape of my own nose, and strike with this spoon upon this table pugnaciously. Oppose ourselves to this illimitable chaos, said Neville, this formless imbecility. Making love to a nursemaid behind a tree, that soldier is more admirable than all the stars. Yet sometimes one trembling star comes in the clear sky and makes me think the world beautiful and we maggots deforming even the trees with our lust. Yet, Louis, said Rhoda, how short a time silence lasts. Already they are beginning to smooth their napkins by the side of their plates. Who comes, says Ginny, and Neville sighs, remembering that Percival comes no more. Ginny has taken out her looking glass. Surveying her face like an artist, she draws a powder puff down her nose, and after one moment of deliberation has given precisely that red to the lips that the lips need. Susan, who feels scorn and fear at the sight of these preparations, fastens the top button of her coat, and unfastens it. What is she making ready for? For something, 
but something different. They are saying to themselves, said Louis, it is time. I am still vigorous, they are saying. My face shall be cut against the black of infinite space. They do not finish their sentences. It is time, they keep saying. The gardens will be shut. And going with them, Rhoda, swept into their current, we shall perhaps drop a little behind. Light like conspirators who have something to whisper, said Rhoda. It is true, and I know for a fact, said Bernard, as we walk down this avenue, that a king, riding, fell over a molehill here. But how strange it seems to set against the whirling abysses of infinite space a little figure with a golden teapot on his head. Soon one recovers belief in figures, but not at once in what they put on their heads. Our English passed one inch of light. Then people put teapots on their heads and say, I am a king. No, I try to recover, as we walk, the sense of time, but with that streaming darkness in my eyes I have lost my grip. This palace seems light as a cloud set for a moment on the sky. It is a trick of the mind to put kings on their thrones, one following another, with crowns on their heads. And we ourselves, walking six abreast, what do we oppose, with this random flicker of light in us that we call brain and feeling, how can we do battle against this flood, what has permanence? Our lives too stream away, down the unlighted avenues, past the strip of time, unidentified. Once Neville threw a poem at my head. Feeling a sudden conviction of immortality, I said, I too know what Shakespeare knew. But that has gone. Unreasonably, ridiculously, said Neville, as we walk, time comes back. A dog does it, prancing. The machine works. Age makes hoary that gateway. Three hundred years now seem no more than a moment vanished against that dog. King William mounts his horse wearing a wig, and the court ladies sweep the turf with their embroidered panniers. I am beginning to be convinced, as we walk, that the fate of Europe is of immense importance, and, ridiculous as it still seems, that all depends upon the Battle of Blenheim. Yes, I declare, as we pass through this gateway, it is the present moment, I am become a subject of King George. While we advance down this avenue, said Louis, I leaning slightly upon Ginny, Bernard arm in arm with Neville, and Susan with her hand in mine, it is difficult not to weep, calling ourselves little children, praying that God may keep us safe while we sleep. It is sweet to sing together, clasping hands, afraid of the dark, while Miss Curry plays the harmonium. The iron gates have rolled back, said Ginny. Time's fangs have ceased their devouring. We have triumphed over the abysses of space, with rouge, with powder, with flimsy pocket handkerchiefs. I grasp, I hold fast, said Susan. I hold firmly to this hand, anyone's, with love, with hatred, it does not matter which. The still mood, the disembodied mood is on us, said Rhoda, and we enjoy this momentary alleviation, it is not often that one has no anxiety, when the walls of the mind become transparent. Wren's palace, like the quartet played to the dry and stranded people in the stalls, makes an oblong. A square is stood upon the oblong and we say, this is our dwelling place. The structure is now visible. Very little is left outside. The flower, said Bernard, the red carnation that stood in the vase on the table of the restaurant when we dined together with Percival, is become a six-sided flower, made of six lives. A mysterious illumination, said Louis, visible against those yew trees. Built up with much pain, many strokes, said Ginny. Marriage, death, travel, friendship said Bernard, town and country, children and all that, a many-sided substance cut out of this dark, a menifacit flower. Let us stop for a moment, let us behold what we have made. Let it blaze against the yew trees. One life. There. It is over. Gone out. Now they vanish, 
said Louis. Susan with Bernard. Neville with Ginny. You and I, Rhoda, stop for a moment by this stone urn. What song shall we hear now that these couples have sought the groves, and Ginny, pointing with her gloved hand, pretends to notice the water lilies, and Susan, who has always loved Bernard, says to him, my ruined life, my wasted life. And Neville, taking Ginny's little hand, with the cherry-coloured fingernails, by the lake, by the moonlit water, cries, love, love, and she answers, imitating the bird, love, love. What song do we hear? They vanish, towards the lake, said Rhoda. They slink away over the grass furtively, yet with assurance as if they asked of our pity their ancient privilege not to be disturbed. The tide in the soul, tipped, flows that way, they cannot help deserting us. The dark has closed over their bodies. What song do we hear, the owls, the nightingales, the wrens? The steamer hoots, the light on the electric rails flashes, the trees gravely bow and bend. The flare hangs over London. Here is an old woman, quietly returning, and a man, a late fisherman, comes down the terrace with his rod. Not a sound, not a movement must escape us. A bird flies homeward, said Louis. Evening opens her eyes and gives one quick glance among the bushes before she sleeps. How shall we put it together, the confused and composite message that they send back to us, and not they only, but many dead, boys and girls, grown men and women, who have wandered here, under one king or another. A weight has dropped into the night, said Rhoda, dragging it down. Every tree is big with a shadow that is not the shadow of the tree behind it. We hear a drumming on the roofs of a fasting city when the Turks are hungry and uncertain-tempered. We hear them crying with sharp, stag-like barks, open, open. Listen to the trams squealing and to the flashes from the electric rails. We hear the beech trees and the birch trees raise their branches as if the bride had let her silken nightdress fall and come to the doorway saying open, open dot. All seems alive, said Louis. I cannot hear death anywhere tonight. Stupidity, on that man's face, age, on that woman's, would be strong enough, one would think, to resist the incantation, and bring in death. But where is death tonight? All the crudity, odds and ends, this and that, have been crushed like glass splinters into the blue, the red fringed tide, which, drawing into the shore, fertile with innumerable fish, breaks at our feet. If we could mount together, if we could perceive from a sufficient height, said Rhoda, if we could remain untouched without any support, but you, disturbed by faint clapping sounds of praise and laughter, and I, resenting compromise and right and wrong on human lips, trust only in solitude and the violence of death and thus are divided. Forever, said Louis, divided. We have sacrificed the embrace among the ferns, and love, love, love by the lake, standing, like conspirators who have drawn apart to share some secret, by the urn. But now look, as we stand here, a ripple breaks on the horizon. The net is raised higher and higher. It comes to the top of the water. The water is broken by silver, by quivering little fish. Now leaping, now lashing, they are laid on shore. Life tumbles its catch upon the grass. There are figures coming towards us. Are they men or are they women? They still wear the ambiguous draperies of the flowing tide in which they have been immersed. Now, said Rhoda, as they pass that tree, they regain their natural size. They are only men, only women. Wonder and awe change as they put off the draperies of the flowing tide. Pity returns, as they emerge into the moonlight, like the relics of an army, our representatives, going every night, here or in Greece, to battle, and coming back every night with their wounds, their ravaged faces. Now light falls on them again. They have faces. They become Susan and Bernard, Ginny and Neville, people we know. Now what a shrinkage takes place. Now what a shriveling, what an humiliation. The old shivers run through me, hatred and terror, as I feel myself grappled to one spot by these hooks they cast on us, these greetings, recognitions, pluckings of the finger and searchings of the eyes.
Yet they have only to speak, and their first words, with the remembered tone and the perpetual deviation from what one expects, and their hands moving and making a thousand past days rise again in the darkness, shake my purpose. Something flickers and dances, said Louis. Illusion returns as they approach down the avenue. Rippling and questioning begin. What do I think of you, what do you think of me? Who are you? Who am I? That quivers again its uneasy air over us, and the pulse quickens and the eye brightens and all the insanity of personal existence without which life would fall flat and die, begins again. They are on us. The southern sun flickers over this urn, we push off into the tide of the violent and cruel sea. Lord help us to act our parts as we greet them returning, Susan and Bernard, Neville and Ginny. We have destroyed something by our presence, said Bernard, a world perhaps. Yet we scarcely breathe, said Neville, spent as we are. We are in that passive and exhausted frame of mind when we only wish to rejoin the body of our mother from whom we have been severed. All else is distasteful, forced and fatiguing. Ginny's yellow scarf is moth-colored in this light, Susan's eyes are quenched. We are scarcely to be distinguished from the river. One cigarette end is the only point of emphasis among us. And sadness tinges our content, that we should have left you, torn the fabric, yielded to the desire to press out, alone, some bitterer, some blacker juice, which was sweet too. But now we are worn out. After our fire, said Ginny, there is nothing left to put in lockets. Still I gape, said Susan, like a young bird, unsatisfied, for something that has escaped me. Let us stay for a moment, said Bernard, before we go. Let us pace the terrace by the river almost alone. It is nearly bedtime. People have gone home. Now how comforting it is to watch the lights coming out in the bedrooms of small shopkeepers on the other side of the river. There is one, there is another. What do you think their takings have been today? Only just enough to pay for the rent, for light and food and the children's clothing. But just enough. What a sense of the tolerableness of life the lights in the bedrooms of small shopkeepers give us. Saturday comes, and there is just enough to pay perhaps for seats at the pictures. Perhaps before they put out the light they go into the little garden and look at the giant rabbit couched in its wooden hut. That is the rabbit they will have for Sunday dinner. Then they put out the light. Then they sleep. And for thousands of people sleep is nothing but warmth and silence and one moment sport with some fantastic dream. I have posted my letter, the greengrocer thinks, to the Sunday newspaper. Suppose I win £500 in the football competition. And we shall kill the rabbit. Life is pleasant. Life is good. I have posted the letter. We shall kill the rabbit. And he sleeps. That goes on. Listen. There is a sound like the knocking of railway trucks in a siding. That is the happy concatenation of one event following another in our lives. Knock, knock, knock. Must, must, must. Must go, must sleep, must wake, must get up, sober, merciful word which we pretend to revile, which we press tight to our hearts, without which we should be undone. How we worship that sound like the knocking together of trucks in a siding. Now far off down the river I hear the chorus, the song of the boasting boys, who are coming back in large sherabangs from a day's outing on the decks of crowded steamers. Still they are singing as they used to sing, across the court, on winter's nights, or with the windows open in summer, getting drunk, breaking the furniture, wearing little striped caps, all turning their heads the same way as the break rounded the corner, and I wished to be with them. What with the chorus, and the spinning water and the just perceptible murmur of the breeze we are slipping away. Little bits of ourselves are crumbling. There. Something very important fell then. I cannot keep myself together. I shall sleep. But we must go, must catch our train, must walk back to the station, must, must, must. We are only bodies jogging along side by side. 
I exist only in the soles of my feet and in the tired muscles of my thighs. We have been walking for hours it seems. But where? I cannot remember. I am like a log slipping smoothly over some waterfall. I am not a judge. I am not called upon to give my opinion. Houses and trees are all the same in this grey light. Is that a post? Is that a woman walking? Here is the station, and if the train were to cut me in two, I should come together on the further side, being one, being indivisible. But what is odd is that I still clasp the return half of my ticket to Waterloo firmly between the fingers of my right hand, even now, even sleeping. Now the sun had sunk. Sky and sea were indistinguishable. The waves breaking spread their white fans far out over the shore, sent white shadows into the recesses of sonorous caves and then rolled back sighing over the shingle. The tree shook its branches and a scattering of leaves fell to the ground. There they settled with perfect composure on the precise spot where they would await dissolution. Black and grey were shot into the garden from the broken vessel that had once held red light. Dark shadows blackened the tunnels between the stalks. The thrush was silent and the worm sucked itself back into its narrow hole. Now and again a whitened and hollow straw was blown from an old nest and fell into the dark grasses among the rotten apples. The light had faded from the tall house wall and the adder's skin hung from the nail empty. All the colours in the room had overflown their banks. The precise brush stroke was swollen and lopsided, cupboards and chairs melted their brown masses into one huge obscurity. The height from floor to ceiling was hung with vast curtains of shaking darkness. The looking glass was pale as the mouth of a cave shadowed by hanging creepers. The substance had gone from the solidity of the hills. Travelling lights drove a plumy wedge among unseen and sunken roads, but no lights opened among the folded wings of the hills, and there was no sound save the cry of a bird seeking some lonelier tree. At the cliff's edge there was an equal murmur of air that had been brushed through forests, of water that had been cooled in a thousand glassy hollows of mid-ocean. As if there were waves of darkness in the air, darkness moved on, covering houses, hills, trees, as waves of water wash round the sides of some sunken ship. Darkness washed down streets, eddying round single figures, engulfing them, blotting out couples clasped under the showery darkness of elm trees in full summer foliage. Darkness rolled its waves along grassy rides and over the wrinkled skin of the turf, enveloping the solitary thorn tree and the empty snail shells at its foot. Mounting higher, darkness blew along the bare upland slopes, and met the fretted and abraded pinnacles of the mountain where the snow lodges forever on the hard rock even when the valleys are full of running streams and yellow vine leaves, and girls, sitting on verandas, look up at the snow, shading their faces with their fans. Them, too, darkness covered. Now to sum up, said Bernard. Now to explain to you the meaning of my life. Since we do not know each other, though I met you once, I think, on board a ship going to Africa, we can talk freely. The illusion is upon me that something adheres for a moment, has roundness, weight, depth, is completed. This, for the moment, seems to be my life. If it were possible, I would hand it to you entire. I would break it off as one breaks off a bunch of grapes. I would say, take it. This is my life. But unfortunately, what I see, this globe, full of figures, you do not see. You see me, sitting at a table opposite you, a rather heavy, elderly man, grey at the temples. You see me take my napkin and unfold it. You see me pour myself out a glass of wine. And you see behind me the door opening, and people passing. But in order to make you understand, to give you my life, I must tell you a story, and there are so many and so many, stories of childhood, stories of school, love, marriage, death, and so on, and none of them are true. Yet like children we tell each other stories, and to decorate them we make up these ridiculous, flamboyant, beautiful phrases. How tired I am of stories, how tired I am of phrases that come down beautifully with all their feet on the ground. Also, how I distrust neat designs of life that are drawn upon half-sheets of notepaper. 
I begin to long for some little language such as lover's use, broken words, inarticulate words, like the shuffling of feet on the pavement. I begin to seek some design more in accordance with those moments of humiliation and triumph that come now and then undeniably. Lying in a ditch on a stormy day, when it has been raining, then enormous clouds come marching over the sky, tattered clouds, wisps of cloud. What delights me then is the confusion, the height, the indifference and the fury. Great clouds always changing, and movement, something sulphurous and sinister, bold up, helter-skelter, towering, trailing, broken off, lost, and I forgotten, minute, in a ditch. Of story, of design, I do not see a trace then. But meanwhile, while we eat, let us turn over these scenes as children turn over the pages of a picture book and the nurse says, pointing, that's a cow. That's a boat. Let us turn over the pages, and I will add, for your amusement, a comment in the margin. In the beginning, there was the nursery, with windows opening onto a garden, and beyond that the sea. I saw something brighten, no doubt the brass handle of a cupboard. Then Mrs. Constable raised the sponge above her head, squeezed it, and out shot, right, left, all down the spine, arrows of sensation. And so, as long as we draw breath, for the rest of time, if we knock against a chair, a table, or a woman, we are pierced with arrows of sensation if we walk in a garden, if we drink this wine. Sometimes indeed, when I pass a cottage with a light in the window where a child has been born, I could implore them not to squeeze the sponge over that new body. Then, there was the garden and the canopy of the current leaves which seemed to enclose everything, flowers, burning like sparks upon the depths of green, a rat wreathing with maggots under a rhubarb leaf, the fly going buzz, buzz, buzz upon the nursery ceiling, and plates upon plates of innocent bread and butter. All these things happen in one second and last forever. Faces loom. Dashing round the corner. Hello, one says, there's Ginny. That's Neville. That's Louis in grey flannel with a snake belt. That's Rhoda. She had a basin in which she sailed petals of white flowers. It was Susan who cried, that day when I was in the tool house with Neville, and I felt my indifference melt. Neville did not melt. Therefore, I said, I am myself, not Neville, a wonderful discovery. Susan cried and I followed her. Her wet pocket handkerchief, and the sight of her little back heaving up and down like a pump handle, sobbing for what was denied her, screwed my nerves up. That is not to be borne, I said, as I sat beside her on the roots that were hard as skeletons. I then first became aware of the presence of those enemies who change, but are always there, the forces we fight against. To let oneself be carried on passively is unthinkable. That's your course, world, one says, mine is this. So, let's explore, I cried, and jumped up, and ran downhill with Susan and saw the stable boy clattering about the yard in great boots. Down below, through the depths of the leaves, the gardeners swept the lawns with great brooms. The lady sat writing. Transfixed, stop dead, I thought, I cannot interfere with a single stroke of those brooms. They sweep and they sweep. Nor with the fixity of that woman writing. It is strange that one cannot stop gardeners sweeping nor dislodge a woman. There they have remained all my life. It is as if one had woken in Stonehenge surrounded by a circle of great stones, these enemies, these presences. Then a wood pigeon flew out of the trees. And being in love for the first time, I made a phrase, a poem about a wood pigeon, a single phrase, for a hole had been knocked in my mind, one of those sudden transparencies through which one sees everything. Then more bread and butter and more flies droning round the nursery ceiling on which quivered islands of light, ruffled, opalescent, while the pointed fingers of the luster dripped blue pools on the corner of the mantelpiece. Day after day as we sat at tea we observed these sights. But we were all different. The wax, the virginal wax that coats the spine melted in different patches for each of us. The growl of the boot boy making love to the tweeny among the gooseberry bushes, the clothes blown out hard on the line, the dead man in the gutter, 
the apple tree, stark in the moonlight, the rat swarming with maggots, the luster dripping blue our white wax was streaked and stained by each of these differently. Louis was disgusted by the nature of human flesh, Rhoda by our cruelty, Susan could not share, Neville wanted order, Ginny love, and so on. We suffered terribly as we became separate bodies. Yet I was preserved from these excesses and have survived many of my friends, am a little stout, grey, rubbed on the thorax as it were, because it is the panorama of life, seen not from the roof, but from the third story window, that delights me, not what one woman says to one man, even if that man is myself. How could I be bullied at school therefore? How could they make things hot for me? There was the doctor lurching into chapel, as if he trod a battleship in a gale of wind, shouting out his commands through a megaphone, since people in authority always become melodramatic I did not hate him like Neville, or revere him like Louis. I took notes as we sat together in chapel. There were pillars, shadows, memorial brasses, boys scuffling and swapping stamps behind prayer books, the sound of a rusty pump, the doctor booming, about immortality and quitting ourselves like men, and Percival scratching his thigh. I made notes for stories, drew portraits in the margin of my pocketbook and thus became still more separate. Here are one or two of the figures I saw. Percival sat staring straight ahead of him that day in chapel. He also had a way of flicking his hand to the back of his neck. His movements were always remarkable. We all flicked our hands to the backs of our heads unsuccessfully. He had the kind of beauty which defends itself from any caress. As he was not in the least precocious, he read whatever was written up for our edification without any comment, and thought with that magnificent equanimity, Latin words come naturally, that was to preserve him from so many meannesses and humiliations, that Lucy's flaxen pigtails and pink cheeks were the height of female beauty. Thus preserved, his taste later was of extreme fineness. But there should be music, some wild carol. Through the window should come a hunting song from some rapid unapprehended life, a sound that shouts among the hills and dies away. What is startling, what is unexpected, what we cannot account for, what turns symmetry to nonsense, that comes suddenly to my mind, thinking of him. The little apparatus of observation is unhinged. Pillars go down, the doctor floats off, some sudden exaltation possesses me. He was thrown, riding in a race, and when I came along Shaftesbury Avenue tonight, those insignificant and scarcely formulated faces that bubble up out of the doors of the tube, and many obscure Indians, and people dying of famine and disease, and women who have been cheated, and whipped dogs and crying children all these seem to me bereft. He would have done justice. He would have protected. About the age of forty he would have shocked the authorities. No lullaby has ever occurred to me capable of singing him to rest. But let me dip again and bring up in my spoon another of these minute objects which we call optimistically, characters of our friends of Louis. He sat staring at the preacher. His being seemed conglobulated in his brow, his lips were pressed, his eyes were fixed, but suddenly they flashed with laughter. Also he suffered from chillblains, the penalty of an imperfect circulation. Unhappy, unfriended, in exile he would sometimes, in moments of confidence, describe how the surf swept over the beaches of his home. The remorseless eye of youth fixed itself upon his swollen joints. Yes, but we were also quick to perceive how cutting, how apt, how severe he was, how naturally, when we lay under the elm trees pretending to watch cricket, we waited his approval, seldom given. His ascendancy was resented, as Percival's was adored. Prim, suspicious, lifting his feet like a crane, there was yet a legend that he had smashed a door with his naked fist. But his peak was too bare, too stony for that kind of mist to cling to it. He was without those simple attachments by which one is connected with another. He remained aloof, enigmatic, a scholar capable of that inspired accuracy which has something formidable about it. My phrase is, how to describe the moon, did not meet with his approval. On the other hand, he envied me to the point of desperation for being at my ease with servants. Not that the sense of his own deserts failed him. That was commensurate with his respect for discipline. Hence his success, finally. 
His life, though, was not happy. But look, his eye turns white as he lies in the palm of my hand. Suddenly the sense of what people are leaves one. I return him to the pool where he will acquire luster. Neville next lying on his back staring up at the summer sky. He floated among us like a piece of thistle down, indolently haunting the sunny corner of the playing field, not listening, yet not remote. It was through him that I have nosed round without ever precisely touching the Latin classics and have also derived some of those persistent habits of thought which make us irredeemably lopsided, for instance about crucifixes, that they are the mark of the devil. Our half-loves and half-hates and ambiguities on these points were to him indefensible treacheries. The swaying and sonorous doctor, whom I made to sit swinging his braces over a gas fire, was to him nothing but an instrument of the Inquisition. So he turned with a passion that made up for his indolence upon Catullus, Horus, Lucretius, lying lazily dormant, yes, but regardant, noticing, with rapture, cricketers, while with a mind like the tongue of an anteater, rapid, dexterous, glutinous, he searched out every curl and twist of those Roman sentences, and sought out one person, always one person to sit beside. And the long skirts of the master's wives would come swishing by, mountainous, menacing, and our hands would fly to our caps. An immense dullness would descend unbroken, monotonous. Nothing, nothing, nothing broke with its fin that leaden waste of waters. Nothing would happen to lift that weight of intolerable boredom. The terms went on. We grew, we changed, for, of course, we are animals. We are not always aware by any means, we breathe, eat, sleep automatically. We exist not only separately but in undifferentiated blobs of matter. With one scoop a whole breakful of boys is swept up and goes cricketing, footballing. An army marches across Europe. We assemble in parks and halls and sedulously oppose any renegade, Neville, Louis, Rhoda, who sets up a separate existence. So I joined them, when Neville sulked or Louis, as I quite agree sublimely, turned on his heel. So I joined them, when Neville sulked or Louis, as I quite agree sublimely, turned on his heel. Thus, not equally by any means or with order, but in great streaks my wax and waistcoat melted, here one drop, there another. Now through this transparency became visible those wondrous pastures, at first so moon-white, radiant, where no foot has been, meadows of the rose, the crocus, of the rock and the snake too, of the spotted and swart, the embarrassing, the binding and tripping up. One leaps out of bed, throws up the window, with what a the birds rise. You know that sudden rush of wings, that exclamation, carol, and confusion, the riot and babble of voices, and all the drops are sparkling, trembling, as if the garden were a splintered mosaic, vanishing, twinkling, not yet formed into one whole, and a bird sings close to the window. I heard those songs. I followed those phantoms. I saw Jones, Dorothy's, Miriam's, I forget their names, passing down avenues, stopping on the crest of bridges to look down into the river. And from among them rise one or two distinct figures, birds who sang with the rapt egotism of youth by the window, broke their snails on stones, dipped their beaks in sticky, viscous matter, hard, avid, remorseless, ginny, Susan, Rhoda. They had been educated on the east coast or on the south coast. They had grown long pigtails and acquired the look of startled foals, which is the mark of adolescence. Jimmy was the first to come sidling up to the gate to eat sugar. She nipped it off the palms of one's hands very cleverly, but her ears were laid back as if she might bite. Rhoda was wild Rhoda one never could catch. She was both frightened and clumsy. It was Susan who first became holy woman, purely feminine. It was she who dropped on my face those scalding tears which are terrible, beautiful, both, neither. She was born to be the adored of poets, since poets require safety, someone who sits sewing, who says, I hate, I love, who is neither comfortable nor prosperous, but has some quality in accordance with the high but unemphatic beauty of pure style which those who create poetry so particularly admire. 
Her father trailed from room to room and down flagged corridors in his flapping dressing gown and worn slippers. On still nights a wall of water fell with a roar a mile off. The ancient dog could scarcely heave himself up onto his chair. And some witless servant could be heard laughing at the top of the house as she whirred the wheel of the sewing machine round and round. That I observed even in the midst of my anguish when, twisting her pocket handkerchief, Susan cried, I love, I hate. A worthless servant, I observed, laughs upstairs in the attic, and that little piece of dramatization shows how incompletely we are merged in our own experiences. On the outskirts of every agony sits some observant fellow who points, who whispers as he whispered to me that summer morning in the house where the corn comes up to the window, the willow grows on the turf by the river. The gardeners sweep with great brooms and the lady sits writing. Thus he directed me to that which is beyond and outside our own predicament, to that which is symbolic, and thus perhaps permanent, if there is any permanence in our sleeping, eating, breathing, so animal, so spiritual and tumultuous lives. The willow tree grew by the river. I sat on the smooth turf with Neville, with Larpent, with Baker, Romsey, Hughes, Percival and Ginny. Through its fine plumes specked with little pricked ears of green in spring, of orange in autumn, I saw boats, buildings, I saw hurrying, decrepit women. I buried match after match in the turf decidedly to mark this or that stage in the process of understanding, it might be philosophy, science, it might be myself, while the fringe of my intelligence floating unattached caught those distant sensations which after a time the mind draws in and works upon, the chime of bells, general murmurs, vanishing figures, one girl on a bicycle who, as she rode, seemed to lift the corner of a curtain concealing the populous undifferentiated chaos of life which surged behind the outlines of my friends and the willow tree. The tree alone resisted our eternal flux. For I changed and changed, was Hamlet, was Shelley, was the hero, whose name I now forget, of a novel by Dostoevsky, was for a whole term, incredibly, Napoleon, but was Byron chiefly. For many weeks at a time it was my part to stride into rooms and fling gloves and coat on the back of chairs, scowling slightly. I was always going to the bookcase for another sip of the divine specific. Therefore, I let fly my tremendous battery of phrases upon somebody quite inappropriate a girl now married, now buried, every book, every window seat was littered with the sheets of my unfinished letters to the woman who made me Byron. For it is difficult to finish a letter in somebody else's style. I arrived all in a lather at her house, exchanged tokens but did not marry her, being no doubt unripe for that intensity. Here again there should be music. Not that wild hunting song, Percival's music, but a painful, guttural, visceral, also soaring, lark-like, peeling song to replace these flagging, foolish transcripts, how much too deliberate. How much too reasonable. Which attempt to describe the flying moment of first love. A purple slide is slipped over the day. Look at a room before she comes and after. Look at the innocents outside pursuing their way. They neither see nor hear, yet on they go. Moving oneself in this radiant yet gummy atmosphere how conscious one is of every movement something adheres, something sticks to one's hands, taking up a newspaper even. Then there is the being eviscerated, drawn out, spun like a spider's web and twisted in agony round a thorn. Then a thunderclap of complete indifference, the light blown out, then the return of measureless irresponsible joy, certain fields seem to glow green forever, and innocent landscapes appear as if in the light of the first dawn, one patch of green, for example, up at Hampstead, and all faces are lit up, all conspire in a hush of tender joy, and then the mystic sense of completion and then that rasping, dogfish skin-like roughness, those black arrows of shivering sensation, when she misses. The post, when she does not come. Out rush a bristle of horned suspicions, horror, 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 but what is the use of painfully elaborating these consecutive sentences when what one needs is nothing consecutive but a bark, a groan. And years later to see a middle-aged woman in a restaurant taking off her cloak. But to return. 
Let us again pretend that life is a solid substance, shaped like a globe, which we turn about in our fingers. Let us pretend that we can make out a plain and logical story, so that when one matter is despatched, love for instance, we go on, in an orderly manner, to the next. I was saying there was a willow tree. Its shower of falling branches, its creased and crooked bark had the effect of what remains outside our illusions yet cannot stay them, is changed by them for the moment, yet shows through stable, still, and with a sternness that our lives lack. Hence the comment it makes, the standard it supplies, and the reason why, as we flow and change, it seems to measure. Neville, for example, sat with me on the turf. But can anything be as clear as all that, I would say, following his gaze, through the branches, to a punt on the river, and a young man eating bananas from a paper bag? The scene was cut out with such intensity and so permeated with the quality of his vision that for a moment I could see it too, the punt, the bananas, the young man, through the branches of the willow tree. Then it faded. Rhoda came wandering vaguely. She would take advantage of any scholar in a blowing gown, or donkey rolling the turf with slippered feet to hide behind. What fear wavered and hid itself and blew to a flame in the depths of her grey, her startled, her dreaming eyes. Cruel and vindictive as we are, we are not bad to that extent. We have our fundamental goodness surely or to talk as I talk freely to someone I hardly know would be impossible, we should cease. The willow as she saw it grew on the verge of a grey desert where no bird sang. The leaves shriveled as she looked at them, tossed in agony as she passed them. The trams and omnibuses roared hoarse in the street ran over rocks and sped foaming away. Perhaps one pillar, sunlit, stood in her desert by a pool where wild beasts come down stealthily to drink. Then Ginny came. She flashed her fire over the tree. She was like a crinkled poppy, febrile, thirsty with the desire to drink dry dust. Darting, angular, not in the least impulsive, she came prepared. So little flames zigzag over the cracks in the dry earth. She made the willows dance but not with illusion, for she saw nothing that was not there. It was a tree, there was the river, it was afternoon, here we were, I in my serge suit, she in green. There was no past, no future, merely the moment in its ring of light, and our bodies, and the inevitable climax, the ecstasy. Louis, when he let himself down on the grass, cautiously spreading, I do not exaggerate, a Macintosh square, made one acknowledge his presence. It was formidable. I had the intelligence to salute his integrity, his research with bony fingers wrapped in rags because of chillblains for some diamond of indissoluble veracity. I buried boxes of burnt matches in holes in the turf at his feet. His grim and caustic tongue reproved my indolence. He fascinated me with his sordid imagination. His heroes wore bowler hats and talked about selling pianos for tenors. Through his landscape the tram squealed, the factory poured its acrid fumes. He haunted mean streets and towns where women lay drunk, naked, on counterpanes on Christmas Day. His words falling from a shot tower hit the water and up it spurted. He found one word, one only for the moon. Then he got up and went, we all got up, we all went. But I, pausing, looked at the tree, and as I looked in autumn at the fiery and yellow branches, some sediment formed, I formed, a drop fell, I fell, that is, from some completed experience I had emerged. I rose and walked away, I, 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 not Byron, Shelley, Dostoevsky, but I, Bernard. I even repeated my own name once or twice. I went, swinging my stick, into a shop, and bought, not that I love music, a picture of Beethoven in a silver frame. Not that I love music, but because the whole of life, its masters, its adventurers, then appeared in long ranks of magnificent human beings behind me, and I was the inheritor, I, the continuer, I, the person miraculously appointed to carry it on. So, swinging my stick, with my eyes filmed, not with pride, but with humility rather, I walked down the street. The first were of wings had gone up, the carol, the exclamation, and now one enters, 
one goes into the house, the dry, uncompromising, inhabited house, the place with all its traditions, its objects, its accumulations of rubbish, and treasures displayed upon tables. I visited the family tailor, who remembered my uncle. People turned up in great quantities, not cut out, like the first faces, Neville, Louis, Ginny, Susan, Rhoda, but confused, featureless, or changed their features so fast that they seemed to have none. And blushing yet scornful, in the oddest condition of raw rapture and skepticism, I took the blow, the mixed sensations, the complex and disturbing and utterly unprepared for impacts of life all over, in all places, at the same time. How upsetting! How humiliating never to be sure what to say next, and those painful silences, glaring as dry deserts, with every pebble apparent, and then to say what one ought not to have said, and then to be conscious of a ramrod of incorruptible sincerity which one would willingly exchange for a shower of smooth pence, but could not, there at that party, where Jimmy sat quite at her ease, rayed out on a gilt chair. Then says some lady with an impressive gesture, come with me. She leads one into a private alcove and admits one to the honor of her intimacy. Surnames change to Christian names, Christian names to nicknames. What is to be done about India, Ireland or Morocco? Old gentlemen answer the question standing decorated under chandeliers. One finds oneself surprisingly supplied with information. Outside the undifferentiated forces roar, inside we are very private, very explicit, have a sense indeed that it is here, in this little room, that we make whatever day of the week it may be. Friday or Saturday. A shell forms upon the soft sole, nacreous, shiny, upon which sensations tap their beaks in vain. On me it formed earlier than on most. Soon I could carve my pear when other people had done dessert. I could bring my sentence to a close in a hush of complete silence. It is at that season too that perfection has a law. One can learn Spanish, one thinks, by tying a string to the right toe and waking early. One fills up the little compartments of one's engagement book with dinner at 8, luncheon at 1.30. One has shirts, socks, ties laid out on one's bed. But it is a mistake, this extreme precision, this orderly and military progress, a convenience, a lie. There is always deep below it, even when we arrive punctually at the appointed time with our white waistcoats and polite formalities, a rushing stream of broken dreams, nursery rhymes, street cries, half-finished sentences, and sights, elm trees, willow trees, gardeners sweeping, women writing, that rise and sink even as we hand a lady down to dinner. While one straightens the fork so precisely on the tablecloth, a thousand faces mop and mow. There is nothing one can fish up in a spoon. Nothing one can call an event. Yet it is alive too and deep, this stream. Immersed in it I would stop between one mouthful and the next, and look intently at a vase, perhaps with one red flower, while a reason struck me, a sudden revelation. Or I would say, walking along the strand, that's the phrase I want, as some beautiful, fabulous phantom bird, fish or cloud with fiery edges swam up to enclose once and for all some notion haunting me, after which on I trotted taking stock with renewed delight of ties and things in shop windows. The crystal, the globe of life as one calls it, far from being hard and cold to the touch, has walls of thinnest air. If I press them all will burst. Whatever sentence I extract whole and entire from this cauldron is only a string of six little fish that let themselves be caught while a million others leap and sizzle, making the cauldron bubble like boiling silver, and slip through my fingers. Faces recur, faces, and faces, they press their beauty to the walls of my bubble, Neville, Susan, Louis, Ginny, Rhoda, and a thousand others. How impossible to order them rightly, to detach one separately, or to give the effect of the whole again like music. What a symphony with its concord and its discord, and its tunes on top and its complicated bass beneath, then grew up. Each played his own tune, fiddle, flute, trumpet, drum or whatever the instrument might be. With Neville, let's discuss Hamlet. 
with Louis, science. With Ginny, love. Then suddenly, in a moment of exasperation, off to Cumberland with a quiet man for a whole week in an inn, with the rain running down the window panes and nothing but mutton and mutton and again mutton for dinner. Yet that week remains a solid stone in the welter of unrecorded sensation. It was then we played dominoes, then we quarreled about tough mutton. Then we walked on the fell. And a little girl, peeping round the door, gave me that letter, written on blue paper, in which I learnt that the girl who had made me Byron was to marry a squire. A man in gaiters, a man with a whip, a man who made speeches about fat oxen at dinner, I exclaimed derisively and looked at the racing clouds, and felt my own failure, my desire to be free, to escape, to be bound, to make an end, to continue, to be Louis, to be myself, and walked out in my Macintosh alone and felt grumpy under the eternal hills and not in the least sublime, and came home and blamed the meat and packed and so back again to the welter, to the torture. Nevertheless, life is pleasant, life is tolerable. Tuesday follows Monday, then comes Wednesday. The mind grows rings, the identity becomes robust, pain is absorbed in growth. Opening and shutting, shutting and opening, with increasing hum and sturdiness, the haste and fever of youth are drawn into service until the whole being seems to expand in and out like the mainspring of a clock. How fast the stream flows from January to December! We are swept on by the torrent of things grown so familiar that they cast no shadow. We float, we float. However, since one must leap, to tell you this story, I leap, here, at this point, and alight now upon some perfectly commonplace object, say the poker and tongs, as I saw them some time later, after that lady who had made me Byron had married, under the light of one whom I will call the third Miss Jones. She is the girl who wears a certain dress expecting one at dinner, who picks a certain rose, who makes one feel steady, steady, this is a matter of some importance, as one shaves. Then one asks, how does she behave to children? One observes that she is a little clumsy with her umbrella, but minded when the mole was caught in the trap, and finally, would not make the loaf at breakfast, I was thinking of the interminable breakfasts of married life as I shaved, altogether prosaic it would not surprise one sitting opposite this girl to see a dragonfly perched on the loaf at breakfast. Also she inspired me with a desire to rise in the world, also she made me look with curiosity at the hitherto repulsive faces of newborn babies. And the little fierce beat, tic-tac, tic-tac of the pulse of one's mind took on a more majestic rhythm. I roamed down Oxford Street. We are the continuers, we are the inheritors, I said, thinking of my sons and daughters, and if the feeling is so grandiose as to be absurd and one conceals it by jumping onto a bus or buying the evening paper, it is still a curious element in the ardour with which one laces up one's boots, with which one now addresses old friends committed to different careers. Louis, the attic dweller, Rhoda, the nymph of the fountain always wet, both contradicted what was then so positive to me, both gave the other side of what seemed to me so evident, that we marry, that we domesticate, for which I loved them, pitied them, and also deeply envied them their different lot. Once I had a biographer, dead long since, but if he still followed my footsteps with his old flattering intensity he would hear say, about this time Bernard married and bought a house. His friends observed in him a growing tendency to domesticity. The birth of children made it highly desirable that he should augment his income. That is the biographic style, and it does to tack together torn bits of stuff, stuff with raw edges. After all, one cannot find fault with the biographic style if one begins letters dear sir, ends them your faithfully, one cannot despise these phrases laid like Roman roads across the tumult of our lives, since they compel us to walk in step like civilized people with the slow and measured tread of policemen though one may be humming any nonsense under one's breath at the same time hark, hark, the dogs do bark, come away, come away, death, let me not to the marriage of true minds. And so on. He attained some success in his profession. He inherited a small sum of money from an uncle, that is how the biographer continues, 
And if one wears trousers and hitches them up with braces, one has to say that, though it is tempting now and then to go blackberrying, tempting to play ducks and drakes with all these phrases. But one has to say that. I became, I mean, a certain kind of man, scoring my path across life as one treads a path across the fields. My boots became worn a little on the left side. When I came in, certain rearrangements took place. Here's Bernard. How differently different people say that. There are many rooms, many Bernards. There was the charming, but weak, the strong, but supercilious, the brilliant, but remorseless, the very good fellow, but, I make no doubt, the awful bore, the sympathetic, but cold, the shabby, but go into the next room, the foppish, worldly, and too well-dressed. What I was to myself was different, was none of these. I am inclined to pin myself down most firmly there before the loaf at breakfast with my wife, who being now entirely my wife and not at all the girl who wore when she hoped to meet me a certain rose, gave me that feeling of existing in the midst of unconsciousness such as the tree frog must have couched on the right shade of green leaf. Pass. I would say. Milk, she might answer, or Mary's coming. Simple words for those who have inherited the spoils of all the ages but not as said then, day after day, in the full tide of life, when one feels complete, entire, at breakfast. Muscles, nerves, intestines, blood vessels, all that makes the coil and spring of our being, the unconscious hum of the engine, as well as the dart and flicker of the tongue, function superbly. Opening, shutting, shutting, opening, eating, drinking, Sometimes speaking, the whole mechanism seemed to expand, to contract, like the mainspring of a clock. Toast and butter, coffee and bacon. The times and letters, suddenly the telephone rang with urgency and I rose deliberately and went to the telephone. I took up the black mouth. I marked the ease with which my mind adjusted itself to assimilate the message it might be, one has these fancies to assume command of the British Empire, I observed my composure, I remarked with what magnificent vitality the atoms of my attention dispersed, swarmed round the interruption, assimilated the message, adapted themselves to a new state of affairs and had created, by the time I put back the receiver, a richer, stronger, a more complicated world in which I was called upon to act my part and had no doubt whatever that I could do it. Clapping my hat on my head, I strode into a world inhabited by vast numbers of men who had also clapped their hats on their heads, and as we jostled and encountered in trains and tubes we exchanged the knowing wink of competitors and comrades braced with a thousand snares and dodges to achieve the same end, to earn our livings. Life is pleasant. Life is good. The mere process of life is satisfactory. Take the ordinary man in good health. He likes eating and sleeping. He likes the snuff of fresh air and walking at a brisk pace down the strand. Or in the country there's a cock crowing on a gate, there's a foal galloping round a field. Something always has to be done next. Tuesday follows Monday, Wednesday Tuesday. Each spreads the same ripple of well-being, repeats the same curve of rhythm, covers fresh sand with a chill or ebbs a little slackly without. So the being grows rings, identity becomes robust. What was fiery and furtive like a fling of grain cast into the air and blown hither and thither by wild gusts of life from every quarter is now methodical and orderly and flung with a purpose, so it seems. Lord, how pleasant! Lord, how good! How tolerable is the life of little shopkeepers, I would say, as the train drew through the suburbs and one saw lights in bedroom windows. Active, energetic as a swarm of ants, I said, as I stood at the window and watched workers, bag in hand, stream into town. What hardness, what energy and violence of limb, I thought, seeing men in white drawers scouring after a football on a patch of snow in January. Now being grumpy about some small matter, it might be the meat, it seemed luxurious to disturb with a little ripple the enormous stability, whose quiver, for our child was about to be born, increased its joy, of our married life. I snapped at dinner. I spoke unreasonably as if, being a millionaire, I could throw away five shillings, or, being a perfect steeplejack, 
stumbled over a footstool on purpose. Going up to bed we settled our quarrel on the stairs, and standing by the window looking at a sky clear like the inside of a blue stone, heaven be praised, I said, we need not whip this prose into poetry. The little language is enough. For the space of the prospect and its clarity seemed to offer no impediment whatsoever, but to allow our lives to spread out and out beyond all bristling of roofs and chimneys to the flawless verge. Into this crash death Percival's. Which is happiness? I said, our child had been born, which pain, referring to the two sides of my body, as I came downstairs, making a purely physical statement. Also I made note of the state of the house, the curtain blowing, the cook singing, the wardrobe showing through the half-opened door. I said, give him, myself, another moment's respite as I went downstairs. Now in this drawing room he is going to suffer. There is no escape. But for pain words are lacking. There should be cries, cracks, fissures, whiteness passing over chintz covers, interference with the sense of time, of space, the sense also of extreme fixity in passing objects, and sounds very remote and then very close, flesh being gashed and blood spurting, a joint suddenly twisted, beneath all of which appears something very important, yet remote, to be just held in solitude. So I went out. I saw the first morning he would never see, the sparrows were like toys dangled from a string by a child. To see things without attachment, from the outside, and to realize their beauty in itself, how strange. And then the sense that a burden has been removed, pretense and make-believe and unreality are gone, and lightness has come with a kind of transparency, making oneself invisible and things seen through as one walks, how strange. And now what other discovery will there be? I said, and in order to hold it tight ignored newspaper placards and went and looked at pictures. Madonnas and pillars, arches and orange trees, still as on the first day of creation, but acquainted with grief, there they hung, and I gazed at them. Here, I said, we are together without interruption. This freedom, this immunity, seemed then a conquest, and stirred in me such exultation that I sometimes go there, even now, to bring back exultation and Percival. But it did not last. What torments one is the horrible activity of the mind's eye how he fell, how he looked, where they carried him, men in loincloths, pulling ropes, the bandages and the mud. Then comes the terrible pounce of memory, not to be foretold, not to be warded off, that I did not go with him to Hampton Court. That claw scratched, that fang tore, I did not go. In spite of his impatiently protesting that it did not matter, why interrupt, why spoil our moment of uninterrupted community? Still, I repeated sullenly, I did not go, and so, driven out of the sanctuary by these officious devils, went to Ginny because she had a room, a room with little tables, with little ornaments scattered on little tables. There I confessed, with tears, I had not gone to Hampton Court. And she, remembering other things, to me trifles but torturing to her, showed me how life withers when there are things we cannot share. Soon, too, a maid came in with a note, and as she turned to answer it and I felt my own curiosity to know what she was writing and to whom, I saw the first leaf fall on his grave. I saw us push beyond this moment, and leave it behind us forever. And then sitting side by side on the sofa we remembered inevitably what had been said by others, the lily of the day is fairer far in May, we compared Percival to a lily, Percival whom I wanted to lose his hair, to shock the authorities, to grow old with me, he was already covered with lilies. So the sincerity of the moment passed, so it became symbolical, and that I could not stand. Let us commit any blasphemy of laughter and criticism rather than exude this lily-sweet glue, and cover him with phrases, I cried. Therefore I broke off, and Ginny, who was without future, or speculation, but respected the moment with complete integrity, gave her body a flick with the whip, powdered her face, for which I loved her, and waved to me as she stood on the doorstep, pressing her hand to her hair so that the wind might not disorder it, a gesture for which I honoured her, as if it confirmed our determination not to let lilies grow. I observed with disillusioned clarity the despicable nonentity of the street, its porches, its window curtains, the drab clothes, 
the cupidity and complacency of shopping women, and old men taking the air in comforters, the caution of people crossing, the universal determination to go on living, when really, fools and gulls that you are, I said, any slate may fly from a roof, any car may swerve, for there is neither rhyme nor reason when a drunk man staggers about with a club in his hand. That is all. I was like one admitted behind the scenes, like one shown how the effects are produced. I returned, however, to my own snug home and was warned by the parlourmaid to creep upstairs in my stockings. The child was asleep. I went to my room. Was there no sword, nothing with which to batter down these walls, this protection, this begetting of children and living behind curtains, and becoming daily more involved and committed, with books and pictures? Better burn one's life out like Louis, desiring perfection, or like Rhoda leave us, flying past us to the desert, or choose one out of millions and one only like Neville, better be like Susan and love and hate the heat of the sun or the frostbitten grass, or be like Ginny, honest, an animal. All had their rapture, their common feeling with death, something that stood them instead. Thus I visited each of my friends in turn, trying, with fumbling fingers, to prize open their locked caskets. I went from one to the other holding my sorrow, no, not my sorrow but the incomprehensible nature of this our life, for their inspection. Some people go to priests, others to poetry, I to my friends, I to my own heart, I to seek among phrases and fragment something unbroken, I to whom there is not beauty enough in moon or tree, to whom the touch of one person with another is all, yet who cannot grasp even that, who am so imperfect, so weak, so unspeakably lonely. There I sat a day. Should this be the end of the story? A kind of sigh? A last ripple of the wave? A trickle of water in some gutter where, burbling, it dies away. Let me touch the table, so, and thus recover my sense of the moment. A sideboard covered with cruets, a basket full of rolls, a plate of bananas, these are comfortable sights. But if there are no stories, what end can there be, or what beginning? Life is not susceptible perhaps to the treatment we give it when we try to tell it. Sitting up late at night it seems strange not to have more control. Pigeonholes are not then very useful. It is strange how force ebbs away and away into some dry creek. Sitting alone, it seems we are spent, our waters can only just surround feebly that spike of sea holly, we cannot reach that further pebble so as to wet it. It is over, we are ended. But wait, I sat all night waiting an impulse again runs through us, we rise, we toss back a manner of white spray, we pound on the shore, we are not to be confined. That is, I shaved and washed, did not wake my wife, and had breakfast, put on my hat, and went out to earn my living. After Monday, Tuesday comes. Yet some doubt remained, some note of interrogation. I was surprised, opening a door, to find people thus occupied, I hesitated, taking a cup of tea, whether one said milk or sugar. And the light of the stars falling, as it falls now, on my hand after travelling for millions upon millions of years I could get a cold shock from that for a moment, not more, my imagination is too feeble. But some doubt remained. A shadow flitted through my mind like moth's wings among chairs and tables in a room in the evening. When, for example, I went to Lincolnshire that summer to see Susan and she advanced towards me across the garden with the lazy movement of a half-filled sail, with the swaying movement of a woman with child, I thought it goes on, but why? We sat in the garden, the farm carts came up dripping with hay, there was the usual gabble of rooks and doves, fruit was netted and covered over, the gardener dug. Bees boomed down the purple tunnels of flowers, bees embedded themselves on the golden shields of sunflowers. Little twigs were blown across the grass. How rhythmical, and half-conscious and like something wrapped in mist it was, but to me hateful, like a net folding one's limbs in its meshes, cramping. She who had refused Percival lent herself to this, to this covering over. Sitting down on a bank to wait for my train, 
I thought then how we surrender, how we submit to the stupidity of nature. Woods covered in thick green leafage lay in front of me. And by some flick of a scent or a sound on a nerve, the old image, the gardener sweeping, the lady writing, returned. I saw the figures beneath the beech trees at Elverdon. The gardener swept, the lady at the table sat writing. But I now made the contribution of maturity to childhood's intuitions, satiety and doom, the sense of what is unescapable in our lot, death, the knowledge of limitations, how life is more obdurate than one had thought it. Then, when I was a child, the presence of an enemy had asserted itself, the need for opposition had stung me. I had jumped up and cried, let's explore. The horror of the situation was ended. Now what situation was there to end? Dullness and doom. And what to explore? The leaves and the wood concealed nothing. If a bird rose I should no longer make a poem I should repeat what I had seen before. Thus if I had a stick with which to point to indentations in the curve of being, this is the lowest, here it coils useless on the mud where no tide comes, here, where I sit with my back to a hedge, and my hat over my eyes, while the sheep advanced remorselessly in that wooden way of theirs, step by step on stiff, pointed legs. But if you hold a blunt blade to a grindstone long enough, something spurts a jagged edge of fire, so held to lack of reason, aimlessness, the usual, all massed together, outspurted in one flame hatred, contempt. I took my mind, my being, the old dejected, almost inanimate object, and lashed it about among these odds and ends, sticks and straws, detestable little bits of wreckage, flotsam and jetsam, floating on the oily surface. I jumped up. I said, fight. Fight. I repeated. It is the effort and the struggle, it is the perpetual warfare, it is the shattering and piecing together, this is the daily battle, defeat or victory, the absorbing pursuit. The trees, scattered, put on order, the thick green of the leaves thinned itself to a dancing light. I netted them under with a sudden phrase. I retrieved them from formlessness with words. The train came in. Lengthening down the platform, the train came to a stop. I caught my train. And so back to London in the evening. How satisfactory, the atmosphere of common sense and tobacco, old women clambering into the third-class carriage with their baskets, the sucking at pipes, the good nights and see you tomorrows of friends parting at wayside stations, and then the lights of London, not the flaring ecstasy of youth, not that tattered violet banner, but still the lights of London all the same, hard, electric lights, high up in offices, street lamps laced along dry pavements. Flares roaring above street markets. I like all this when I have dispatched the enemy for a moment. Also I like to find the pageant of existence roaring, in a theatre for instance. The clay-coloured, earthy nondescript animal of the field here erects himself and with infinite ingenuity and effort puts up a fight against the green woods and green fields and sheep advancing with measured tread, munching. And, of course, windows in the long grey streets were lit up. Strips of carpet cut the pavement, there were swept and garnished rooms, fire, food, wine, talk. Men with withered hands, women with pal pagodas hanging from their ears, came in and went out. I saw old men's faces carved into wrinkles and sneers by the work of the world, beauty cherished so that it seemed newly sprung even in age, and youth so apt for pleasure that pleasure, one thought, must exist, it seemed that grasslands must roll for it and the sea be chopped up into little waves, and the woods rustle with bright-coloured birds for youth, for youth expectant. There one met Ginny and Hal, Tom and Betty, there we had our jokes and shared our secrets, and never parted in the doorway without arranging to meet again in some other room as the occasion, as the time of the year, suggested. Life is pleasant, life is good. After Monday comes Tuesday, and Wednesday follows. Yes, but after a time with a difference. It may be that something in the look of the room one night, in the arrangement of the chairs, suggests it. It seems comfortable to sink down on a sofa in a corner, to look, to listen. Then it happens that two figures standing with their backs to the window appear against the branches of a spreading willow. With a shock of emotion one feels there are figures without features robed in beauty. 
In the pause that follows while the ripples spread, the girl to whom one should be talking says to herself, he is old. But she is wrong. It is not age, it is that a drop has fallen, another drop. Time has given the arrangement another shake. Out we creep from the arch of the current leaves, out into a wider world. The true order of things, this is our perpetual illusion, is now apparent. Thus in a moment, in a drawing room, our life adjusts itself to the majestic march of day across the sky. It was for this reason that instead of pulling on my patent leather shoes and finding a tolerable tie, I sought Neville. I sought my oldest friend, who had known me when I was Byron, when I was Meredith's young man, and also that hero in a book by Dostoevsky whose name I have forgotten. I found him alone, reading. A perfectly neat table, a curtain pulled methodically straight, a paper knife dividing a French volume nobody, I thought, ever changes the attitude in which we saw them first, or the clothes. Here he has sat in this chair, in these clothes, ever since we first met. Here was freedom, here was intimacy, the firelight broke off some round apple on the curtain. There we talked, sat talking, sauntered down that avenue, the avenue which runs under the trees, under the thick-leaved murmuring trees, the trees that are hung with fruit, which we have trodden so often together, so that now the turf is bare round some of those trees, round certain plays and poems, certain favourites of ours, the turf is trodden bare by our incessant unmethodical pacing. If I have to wait, I read, if I wake in the night, I feel along the shelf for a book. Swelling, perpetually augmented, there is a vast accumulation of unrecorded matter in my head. Now and then I break off a lump, Shakespeare it may be, it may be some old woman called Peck, and say to myself, smoking a cigarette in bed, that's Shakespeare. That's Peck, with a certainty of recognition and a shock of knowledge which is endlessly delightful, though not to be imparted. So we shared our Pecks, our Shakespeare's, compared each other's versions, allowed each other's insight to set our own Peck or Shakespeare in a better light, and then sank into one of those silences which are now and again broken by a few words, as if a fin rose in the wastes of silence, and then the fin, the thought, sinks back into the depths, spreading round it a little ripple of satisfaction, content. Yes, but suddenly one hears a clock tick. We who had been immersed in this world became aware of another. It is painful. It was Neville who changed our time. He, who had been thinking with the unlimited time of the mind, which stretches in a flash from Shakespeare to ourselves, poked the fire and began to live by that other clock which marks the approach of a particular person. The wide and dignified sweep of his mind contracted. He became on the alert. I could feel him listening to sounds in the street. I noted how he touched a cushion. From the myriads of mankind and all time past he had chosen one person, one moment in particular. A sound was heard in the hall. What he was saying wavered in the air like an uneasy flame. I watched him disentangle one footstep from other footsteps, wait for some particular mark of identification and glance with the swiftness of a snake at the handle of the door. Hence the astonishing acuteness of his perceptions. He has been trained always by one person. So concentrated a passion shot out others like foreign matter from a still, sparkling fluid. I became aware of my own vague and cloudy nature full of sediment, full of doubt, full of phrases and notes to be made in pocketbooks. The folds of the curtain became still, statuesque, the paperweight on the table hardened, the threads on the curtain sparkled, everything became definite, external, a scene in which I had no part. I rose, therefore, I left him. Heavens! How they caught me as I left the room, the fangs of that old pain. The desire for someone not there. For whom? I did not know at first, then remembered Percival. I had not thought of him for months. Now to laugh with him, to laugh with him at Neville, that was what I wanted, to walk off arm in arm together laughing. But he was not there. The place was empty. It is strange how the dead leap out on us at street corners, or in dreams. 
This fitful gust blowing so sharp and cold upon me sent me that night across London to visit other friends, Rhoda and Louis, desiring company, certainty, contact. I wondered, as I mounted the stairs, what was their relationship? What did they say alone? I figured her awkward with the tea kettle. She gazed over the slate roofs, the nymph of the fountain always wet, obsessed with visions, dreaming. She parted the curtain to look at the night. Away, she said. The moor is dark beneath the moon. I rang, I waited. Louis perhaps poured out milk in a saucer for the cat, Louis, whose bony hands shut like the sides of a dock closing themselves with a slow anguish of effort upon an enormous tumult of waters, who knew what has been said by the Egyptian, the Indian, by men with high cheekbones and solitaires in hair shirts. I knocked, I waited, there was no answer. I tramped down the stone stairs again. Our friends, how distant, how mute, how seldom visited and little known. And I, too, am dim to my friends and unknown, a phantom, sometimes seen, often not. Life is a dream surely. Our flame, the will o' the wisp that dances in a few eyes, is soon to be blown out and all will fade. I recalled my friends. I thought of Susan. She had bought fields. Cucumbers and tomatoes ripened in her hothouses. The vine that had been killed by last year's frost was putting out a leaf or two. She walked heavily with her sons across her meadows. She went about the land attended by men in gaiters, pointing with her stick at a roof, at hedges, at walls fallen into disrepair. The pigeons followed her, waddling, for the grain that she let fall from her capable, earthy fingers. But I no longer rise at dawn, she said. Then Ginny entertaining, no doubt, some new young man. They reached the crisis of the usual conversation. The room would be darkened, chairs arranged. For she still sought the moment. Without illusions, hard and clear as crystal, she rode at the day with her breast bared. She let its spikes pierce her. When the lock whitened on her forehead she twisted it fearlessly among the rest. So when they come to bury her nothing will be out of order. Bits of ribbons will be found curled up. But still the door opens. Who is coming in? She asks, and rises to meet him, prepared, as on those first spring nights when the tree under the big London houses where respectable citizens were going soberly to bed scarcely sheltered her love and the squeak of trams mixed with her cry of delight and the rippling of leaves had to shade her languor, her delicious lassitude as she sank down called by all the sweetness of nature satisfied. Our friends, how seldom visited, how little known, it is true, and yet, when I meet an unknown person, and try to break off, here at this table, what I call my life, it is not one life that I look back upon, I am not one person, I am many people. I do not altogether know who I am, Ginny, Susan, Neville, Rhoda, or Louis, or how to distinguish my life from theirs. So I thought that night in early autumn when we came together and dined once more at Hampton Court. Our discomfort was at first considerable, for each by that time was committed to a statement, and the other person coming along the road to the meeting place dressed like this or that, with a stick or without, seemed to contradict it. I saw Ginny look at Susan's earthy fingers and then hide her own, I, considering Neville, so neat and exact, felt the nebulosity of my own life blurred with all these phrases. He then boasted, because he was ashamed of one room and one person and his own success. Louis and Rhoda, the conspirators, the spies at table, who take notes, felt, after all, Bernard can make the waiter fetch us rolls, a contact denied us. We saw for a moment laid out among us the body of the complete human being whom we have failed to be, but at the same time, cannot forget. All that we might have been we saw, all that we had missed, and we grudged for a moment the other's claim, as children when the cake is cut, the one cake, the only cake, watch their slice diminishing. However, we had our bottle of wine, and under that seduction lost our enmity and stopped comparing. And, halfway through dinner, we felt enlarge itself round us the huge blackness of what is outside us, of what we are not. The wind, the rush of wheels became the roar of time, and we rushed where? 
And who were we? We were extinguished for a moment, went out like sparks in burnt paper and the blackness roared. Past time, past history we went. For me this lasts but one second. It is ended by my own pugnacity. I strike the table with a spoon. If I could measure things with compasses I would, but since my only measure is a phrase, I make phrases, I forget what, on this occasion. We became six people at a table in Hampton Court. We rose and walked together down the avenue. In the thin, the unreal twilight, fitfully like the echo of voices laughing down some alley, geniality returned to me and flesh. Against the gateway, against some cedar tree I saw blaze bright, Neville, Ginny, Rhoda, Louis, Susan, and myself, our life, our identity. Still King William seemed an unreal monarch and his crown mere tinsel. But we against the brick, against the branches, we six, out of how many million millions, for one moment out of what measureless abundance of past time and time to come, burnt there triumphant. The moment was all, the moment was enough. And then Neville, Ginny, Susan, and I, as a wave breaks, burst asunder, surrendered to the next leaf, to the precise bird, to a child with a hoop, to a prancing dog, to the warmth that is hoarded in woods after a hot day, to the lights twisted like white ribbon on rippled waters. We drew apart, we were consumed in the darkness of the trees, leaving Rhoda and Louis to stand on the terrace by the urn. When we emerged from that immersion, how sweet, how deep! And came to the surface and saw the conspirators still standing there it was with some compunction. We had lost what they had kept. We interrupted. But we were tired, and whether it had been good or bad, accomplished or left undone, the dusky veil was falling upon our endeavours, the lights were sinking as we paused for a moment upon the terrace that overlooks the river. The steamers were landing their trippers on the bank, there was a distant cheering, the sound of singing, as if people waved their hats and joined in some last song. The sound of the chorus came across the water and I felt leap up that old impulse, which has moved me all my life, to be thrown up and down on the roar of other people's voices, singing the same song, to be tossed up and down on the roar of almost senseless merriment, sentiment, triumph, desire. But not now. No. I could not collect myself, I could not distinguish myself, I could not help letting fall the things that had made me a minute ago eager, amused, jealous, vigilant, and hosts of other things, into the water. I could not recover myself from that endless throwing away, dissipation, flooding forth without our willing it and rushing soundlessly away out there under the arches of the bridge, round some clump of trees or an island, out where seabirds sit on stakes, over the roughened water to become waves in the sea, I could not recover myself from that dissipation. So we parted. Was this, then, this streaming away mixed with Susan, Ginny, Neville, Rhoda, Louis, a sort of death? A new assembly of elements? Some hint of what was to come? The note was scribbled, the book shut, for I am an intermittent student. I do not say my lessons by any means at the stated hour. Later, walking down Fleet Street at the rush hour, I recalled that moment, I continued it. Must I forever, I said, beat my spoon on the tablecloth? Shall I not, too, consent? The omnibuses were clogged, one came up behind another and stopped with a click, like a link added to a stone chain. People passed. Multitudinous, carrying attach cases, dodging with incredible celerity in and out, they went past like a river in spate. They went past roaring like a train in a tunnel. Seizing my chance I crossed, dived down a dark passage and entered the shop where they cut my hair. I leant my head back and was swathed in a sheet. Looking glasses confronted me in which I could see my pinioned body and people passing, stopping, looking, and going on indifferent. The hairdresser began to move his scissors to and fro. I felt myself powerless to stop the oscillations of the cold steel. So we are cut and laid in swaths, I said, so we lie side by side on the damp meadows, withered branches, and flowering. We have no more to expose ourselves on the bare hedges to the wind and snow, 
no more to carry ourselves erect when the gale sweeps, to bear our burden upheld, or stay, unmurmuring, on those pallid noondays when the bird creeps close to the bough and the damp whitens the leaf. We are cut, we are fallen. We are become part of that unfeeling universe that sleeps when we are at our quickest and burns red when we lie asleep. We have renounced our station and lie now flat, withered and how soon forgotten. Upon which I saw an expression in the tail of the eye of the hairdresser as if something interested him in the street. What interested the hairdresser? What did the hairdresser see in the street? It is thus that I am recalled. For I am no mystic, something always plucks at me curiosity, envy, admiration, interest in hairdressers and the like bring me to the surface. While he brushed the fluff from my coat I took pains to assure myself of his identity, and then, swinging my stick, I went into the strand, and evoked to serve as opposite to myself the figure of Rhoda, always so furtive, always with fear in her eyes, always seeking some pillar in the desert, to find which she had gone, she had killed herself. Wait, I said, putting my arm in imagination, thus we consort with our friends, through her arm. Wait until these omnibuses have gone by. Do not cross so dangerously. These men are your brothers. In persuading her I was also persuading my own soul. For this is not one life, nor do I always know if I am man or woman, Bernard or Neville, Louis, Susan, Ginny, or Rhoda, so strange is the contact of one with another. Swinging my stick, with my hair newly cut and the nape of my neck tingling, I went past all those trays of penny toys imported from Germany that men hold out in the street by St. Paul's, St. Paul's, the brooding hen with spread wings from whose shelter run omnibuses and streams of men and women at the rush hour. I thought how Louis would mount those steps in his neat suit with his cane in his hand and his angular, rather detached gait. With his Australian accent, my father, a banker at Brisbane, he would come, I thought, with greater respect to these old ceremonies than I do, who have heard the same lullabies for a thousand years. I am always impressed, as I enter, by the rubbed roses, the polished brasses, the flapping and the chanting, while one boy's voice wails round the dome like some lost and wandering dove. The recumbency and the peace of the dead impress me warriors at rest under their old banners. Then I scoff at the floridity and absurdity of some scrolloping tomb, and the trumpets and the victories and the coats of arms and the certainty, so sonorously repeated, of resurrection, of eternal life. My wandering and inquisitive eye then shows me an awe-stricken child, a shuffling pensioner, or the obeisances of tired shop girls burdened with heaven knows what strife in their poor thin breasts come to solace themselves in the rush hour. I stray and look and wonder, and sometimes, rather furtively, try to rise on the shaft of somebody else's prayer into the dome, out, beyond, wherever they go. But then like the lost and wailing dove, I find myself failing, fluttering, descending, and perching upon some curious gargoyle, some battered nose or absurd tombstone, with humour, with wonder, and so again watch the sightseers with their baedekers shuffling past, while the boy's voice soars in the dome and the organ now and then indulges in a moment of elephantine triumph. How then, I asked, would Louis roof us all in? How would he confine us, make us one, with his red ink, with his very fine nib? The voice petered out in the dome, wailing. So into the street again, swinging my stick, looking at wire trays in stationers' shop windows, at baskets of fruit grown in the colonies, murmuring pillicock sat on pillicock's hill, or hark, hark, the dogs do bark, or the world's great age begins anew, or come away, come away, death mingling nonsense and poetry, floating in the stream. Something always has to be done next. Tuesday follows Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Each spreads the same ripple. The being grows rings, like a tree. Like a tree, leaves fall. For one day as I leant over a gate that led into a field, the rhythm stopped, the rhymes and the hummings, the nonsense and the poetry. A space was cleared in my mind. I saw through the thick leaves of habit. Leaning over the gate I regretted so much litter, so much unaccomplishment and separation, for one cannot cross London to see a friend, life being so full of engagements, 
nor take ship to India and see a naked man spearing fish in blue water. I said life had been imperfect, an unfinishing phrase. It had been impossible for me, taking snuff as I do from any bagman met in a train, to keep coherency, that sense of the generations, of women carrying red pitchers to the Nile, of the nightingale who sings among conquests and migrations. It had been too vast an undertaking, I said, and how can I go on lifting my foot perpetually to climb the stair? I addressed myself as one would speak to a companion with whom one is voyaging to the North Pole. I spoke to that self who had been with me in many tremendous adventures, the faithful man who sits over the fire when everybody has gone to bed, stirring the cinders with a poker, the man who has been so mysteriously and with sudden accretions of being built up, in a beech wood, sitting by a willow tree on a bank, leaning over a parapet at Hampton Court, the man who has collected himself in moments of emergency and banged his spoon on the table, saying, I will not consent. This self now as I leant over the gate looking down over fields rolling in waves of colour beneath me made no answer. He threw up no opposition. He attempted no phrase. His fist did not form. I waited. I listened. Nothing came, nothing. I cried then with a sudden conviction of complete desertion, now there is nothing. No fin breaks the waste of this immeasurable sea. Life has destroyed me. No echo comes when I speak, no varied words. This is more truly death than the death of friends, than the death of youth. I am the swathed figure in the hairdresser's shop taking up only so much space. The scene beneath me withered. It was like the eclipse when the sun went out and left the earth, flourishing in full summer foliage, withered, brittle, false. Also I saw on a winding road in a dust dance the groups we had made how they came together, how they ate together, how they met in this room or that. I saw my own indefatigable busyness, how I had rushed from one to the other, fetched and carried, travelled and returned, joined this group and that, here kissed, here withdrawn, always kept hard at it by some extraordinary purpose, with my nose to the ground like a dog on the scent, with an occasional toss of the head, an occasional cry of amazement, despair and then back again with my nose to the scent. What a litter, what a confusion, with here birth, here death, succulence and sweetness, effort and anguish, and myself always running hither and thither. Now it was done with. I had no more appetites to glut, no more stings in me with which to poison people, no more sharp teeth and clutching hands or desire to feel the pear and the grape and the sun beating down from the orchard wall. The woods had vanished, the earth was a waste of shadow. No sound broke the silence of the wintry landscape. No cock crowed, no smoke rose, no train moved. A man without a self, I said. A heavy body leaning on a gate. A dead man. With dispassionate despair, with entire disillusionment, I surveyed the dust dance, my life, my friends' lives, and those fabulous presences, men with brooms, women writing, the willow tree by the river, clouds and phantoms made of dust too, of dust that changed, as clouds lose and gain and take gold or red and lose their summits and billow this way and that, mutable, vain. I, carrying a notebook, making phrases, had recorded mere changes, a shadow. I had been sedulous to take note of shadows. How can I proceed now, I said, without a self, weightless and visionless, through a world weightless, without illusion. The heaviness of my despondency thrust open the gate I lent on and pushed me, an elderly man, a heavy man with grey hair, through the colourless field, the empty field. No more to hear echoes, no more to see phantoms, to conjure up no opposition, but to walk always unshadowed, making no impress upon the dead earth. If even there had been sheep munching, pushing one foot after another, or a bird, or a man driving a spade into the earth, had there been a bramble to trip me, or a ditch, damp with soaked leaves, into which to fall, but no, the melancholy path led along the level, to more wintriness and pallor and the equal and uninteresting view of the same landscape. How then does light return to the world after the eclipse of the sun? Miraculously. Fraily. In thin stripes. 
It hangs like a glass cage. It is a hoop to be fractured by a tiny jar. There is a spark there. Next moment a flush of done. Then a vapor as if earth were breathing in and out, once, twice, for the first time. Then under the dullness someone walks with a green light. Then off twists a white wraith. The woods throb blue and green, and gradually the fields drink in red, gold, brown. Suddenly a river snatches a blue light. The earth absorbs color like a sponge slowly drinking water. It puts on weight, rounds itself, hangs pendant, settles and swings beneath our feet. So the landscape returned to me, so I saw the fields rolling in waves of color beneath me, but now with this difference, I saw but was not seen. I walked unshadowed, I came unheralded. From me had dropped the old cloak, the old response, the hollowed hand that beats back sounds. Thin as a ghost, leaving no trace where I trod, perceiving merely, I walked alone in a new world, never trodden, brushing new flowers, unable to speak save in a child's words of one syllable, without shelter from phrases, I who have made so many, unattended, I who have always gone with my kind, solitary, I who have always had someone to share the empty grate, or the cupboard with its hanging loop of gold. But how describe the world seen without a self? There are no words. Blue, red even they distract, even they hide with thickness instead of letting the light through. How describe or say anything in articulate words again? Save that it fades, save that it undergoes a gradual transformation, becomes, even in the course of one short walk, habitual, this scene also. Blindness returns as one moves and one leaf repeats another. Loveliness returns as one looks, with all its train of phantom phrases. One breathes in and out substantial breath, down in the valley the train draws across the fields lopped with smoke. But for a moment I had sat on the turf somewhere high above the flow of the sea and the sound of the woods, had seen the house, the garden, and the waves breaking. The old nurse who turns the pages of the picture book had stopped and had said, look. This is the truth. So I was thinking as I came along Shaftesbury Avenue tonight. I was thinking of that page in the picture book. And when I met you in the place where one goes to hang up one's coat I said to myself, it does not matter whom I meet. All this little affair of being is over. Who this is I do not know, nor care, we will dine together. So I hung up my coat, tapped you on the shoulder, and said, sit with me. Now the meal is finished, we are surrounded by peelings and breadcrumbs. I have tried to break off this bunch and hand it you, but whether there is substance or truth in it I do not know. Nor do I know exactly where we are. What city does that stretch of sky look down upon? Is it Paris, is it London where we sit, or some southern city of pink-washed houses lying under cypresses, under high mountains, where eagles soar? I do not at this moment feel certain. I begin now to forget, I begin to doubt the fixity of tables, the reality of here and now, to tap my knuckles smartly upon the edges of apparently solid objects and say, are you hard? I have seen so many different things, have made so many different sentences. I have lost in the process of eating and drinking and rubbing my eyes along surfaces that thin, hard shell which cases the soul, which, in youth, shuts one in hence the fierceness, and the tap, tap, tap of the remorseless beaks of the young. And now I ask, who am I? I have been talking of Bernard, Neville, Ginny, Susan, Rhoda, and Louis. Am I all of them? Am I one and distinct? I do not know. We sat here together. But now Percival is dead, and Rhoda is dead, we are divided, we are not here. Yet I cannot find any obstacle separating us. There is no division between me and them. As I talked I felt I am you. This difference we make so much of, this identity we so feverishly cherish, was overcome. Yes, ever since old Mrs. Constable lifted her sponge and pouring warm water over me covered me with flesh I have been sensitive, percipient. Here on my brow is the blow I got when Percival fell. Here on the nape of my neck is the kiss Ginny gave Louis. 
my eyes fill with Susan's tears. I see far away, quivering like a gold thread, the pillar road I saw, and feel the rush of the wind of her flight when she leapt. Thus when I come to shape here at this table between my hands the story of my life and set it before you as a complete thing, I have to recall things gone far, gone deep, sunk into this life or that and become part of it, dreams, too, things surrounding me, and the inmates, those old half-articulate ghosts who keep up their hauntings by day and night, who turn over in their sleep, who utter their confused cries, who put out their phantom fingers and clutch at me as I try to escape shadows of people one might have been, unborn selves. There is the old brute, too, the savage, the hairy man who dabbles his fingers in ropes of entrails, and gobbles and belches, whose speech is guttural, visceral, well, he is here. He squats in me. Tonight he has been feasted on quails, salad, and sweetbread. He now holds a glass of fine old brandy in his paw. He brindles, purrs, and shoots warm thrills all down my spine as I sip. It is true, he washes his hands before dinner, but they are still hairy. He buttons on trousers and waistcoats, but they contain the same organs. He jibs if I keep him waiting for dinner. He mops and mows perpetually, pointing with his half-idiot gestures of greed and covetousness at what he desires. I assure you, I have great difficulty sometimes in controlling him. That man, the hairy, the ape-like, has contributed his part to my life. He has given a greener glow to green things, has held his torch with its red flames, its thick and smarting smoke, behind every leaf. He has lit up the cool garden even. He has brandished his torch in murky by-streets where girls suddenly seem to shine with a red and intoxicating translucency. Oh, he has tossed his torch high. He has led me wild dances. But no more. Now tonight, my body rises tear upon tear like some cool temple whose floor is strewn with carpets and murmurs rise and the altars stand smoking, but up above, here in my serene head, comes only fine gusts of melody, waves of incense, while the lost dove wails, and the banners tremble above tombs, and the dark airs of midnight shake trees outside the open windows. When I look down from this transcendency, how beautiful are even the crumbled relics of bread. What shapely spirals the peelings of pears make, how thin, and mottled like some seabird's egg. Even the forks laid straight side by side appear lucid, logical, exact, and the horns of the rolls which we have left are glazed, yellow-plated, hard. I could worship my hand even, with its fan of bones laced by blue mysterious veins and its astonishing look of aptness, suppleness, and ability to curl softly or suddenly crush its infinite sensibility. Immeasurably receptive, holding everything, trembling with fullness, yet clear, contained, so my being seems, now that desire urges it no more out and away, now that curiosity no longer dyes it a thousand colors. It lies deep, tideless, immune, now that he is dead, the man I called Bernard, the man who kept a book in his pocket in which he made notes, phrases for the moon, notes of features, how people looked, turned, dropped their cigarette ends, under B, butterfly powder, under D, ways of naming death. But now let the door open, the glass door that is forever turning on its hinges. Let a woman come, let a young man in evening dress with a moustache sit down, is there anything that they can tell me? No. I know all that, too. And if she suddenly gets up and goes, my dear, I say, you no longer make me look after you. The shock of the falling wave which has sounded all my life, which woke me so that I saw the gold loop on the cupboard, no longer makes quiver what I hold. So now, taking upon me the mystery of things, I could go like a spy without leaving this place, without stirring from my chair. I can visit the remote verges of the desert lands where the savage sits by the campfire. Day rises, the girl lifts the watery fire-hearted jewels to her brow, the sun levels his beams straight at the sleeping house, the waves deepen their bars, they fling themselves on shore, back blows the spray, sweeping their waters they surround the boat and the sea holly. The birds sing in chorus, deep tunnels run between the stalks of flowers, the house is whitened, the sleeper stretches, Gradually all is astir. 
Light floods the room and drives shadow beyond shadow to where they hang in folds inscrutable. What does the central shadow hold? Something? Nothing? I do not know. Oh, but there is your face. I catch your eye. I, who had been thinking myself so vast, a temple, a church, a whole universe, unconfined and capable of being everywhere on the verge of things and here too, am now nothing but what you see an elderly man, rather heavy, grey above the ears, who, I see myself in the glass, leans one elbow on the table, and holds in his left hand a glass of old brandy. That is the blow you have dealt me. I have walked bang into the pillar box. I reel from side to side. I put my hands to my head. My hat is off, I have dropped my stick. I have made an awful ass of myself and am justly laughed at by any passerby. Lord, how unutterably disgusting life is! What dirty tricks it plays us, one moment free, the next, this. Here we are among the breadcrumbs and the stained napkins again. That knife is already congealing with grease. Disorder, sordidity, and corruption surround us. We have been taking into our mouths the bodies of dead birds. It is with these greasy crumbs, slobbered over napkins, and little corpses that we have to build. Always it begins again, always there is the enemy, eyes meeting ours, fingers twitching ours, the effort waiting. Call the waiter. Pay the bill. We must pull ourselves up out of our chairs. We must find our coats. We must go. Must, 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 detestable word. Once more, I who had thought myself immune, who had said, now I am rid of all that, find that the wave has tumbled me over, head over heels, scattering my possessions, leaving me to collect, to assemble, to heap together, summon my forces, rise, and confront the enemy. It is strange that we, who are capable of so much suffering, should inflict so much suffering. Strange that the face of a person whom I scarcely know save that I think we met once on the gangway of a ship bound for Africa a mere adumbration of eyes, cheeks, nostrils, should have power to inflict this insult. You look, eat, smile, are bored, pleased, annoyed, that is all I know. Yet this shadow which has sat by me for an hour or two, this mask from which peep two eyes, has power to drive me back, to pinion me down among all those other faces, to shut me in a hot room, to send me dashing like a moth from candle to candle. But wait. While they add up the bill behind the screen, wait one moment. Now that I have reviled you for the blow that sent me staggering among peelings and crumblings and old scraps of meat, I will record in words of one syllable how also under your gaze with that compulsion on me I begin to perceive this, that and the other. The clock ticks, the woman sneezes, the waiter comes, there is a gradual coming together, running into one, acceleration and unification. Listen, a whistle sounds, wheels rush, the door creaks on its hinges. I regain the sense of the complexity and the reality and the struggle, for which I thank you. And with some pity, some envy and much goodwill, take your hand and bid you good night. Heaven be praised for solitude. I am alone now. That almost unknown person has gone, to catch some train, to take some cab, to go to some place or person whom I do not know. The face looking at me has gone. The pressure is removed. Here are empty coffee cups. Here are chairs turned but nobody sits on them. Here are empty tables and nobody any more coming to dine at them tonight. Let me now raise my song of glory. Heaven be praised for solitude. Let me be alone. Let me cast and throw away this veil of being, this cloud that changes with the least breath, night and day, and all night and all day. While I sat here I have been changing. I have watched the sky change. I have seen clouds cover the stars, then free the stars, then cover the stars again. Now I look at their changing no more. Now no one sees me and I change no more. Heaven be praised for solitude that has removed the pressure of the eye, the solicitation of the body, and all need of lies and phrases. My book, stuffed with phrases, has dropped to the floor. It lies under the table, 
to be swept up by the charwoman when she comes wearily at dawn looking for scraps of paper, old tram tickets, and here and there a note screwed into a ball and left with the litter to be swept up. What is the phrase for the moon? And the phrase for love? By what name are we to call death? I do not know. I need a little language such as lovers use, words of one syllable such as children speak when they come into the room and find their mother sewing and pick up some scrap of bright wool, a feather, or a shred of chintz. I need a howl, a cry. When the storm crosses the marsh and sweeps over me where I lie in the ditch unregarded I need no words. Nothing neat. Nothing that comes down with all its feet on the floor. None of those resonances and lovely echoes that break and chime from nerve to nerve in our breasts, making wild music, false phrases. I have done with phrases. How much better is silence, the coffee cup, the table? How much better to sit by myself like the solitary seabird that opens its wings on the stake? Let me sit here forever with bare things, this coffee cup, this knife, this fork, things in themselves, myself being myself. Do not come and worry me with your hints that it is time to shut the shop and be gone. I would willingly give all my money that you should not disturb me but will let me sit on and on, silent, alone. But now the head waiter, who has finished his own meal, appears and frowns, he takes his muffler from his pocket and ostentatiously makes ready to go. They must go, must put up the shutters, most fold the tablecloths, and give one brush with a wet mop under the tables. Curse you then. However beat and done with it all I am, I must haul myself up, and find the particular coat that belongs to me, must push my arms into the sleeves, must muffle myself up against the night air and be off. I, 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 tired as I am, spent as I am, and almost worn out with all this rubbing of my nose along the surfaces of things, even I, an elderly man who is getting rather heavy and dislikes exertion, must take myself off and catch some last train. Again I see before me the usual street. The canopy of civilization is burnt out. The sky is dark as polished whalebone. But there is a kindling in the sky whether of lamplight or of dawn. There is a stir of some sort, sparrows on plain trees somewhere chirping. There is a sense of the break of day. I will not call it dawn. What is dawn in the city to an elderly man standing in the street looking up rather dizzily at the sky? Dawn is some sort of whitening of the sky, some sort of renewal. Another day, another Friday, another 20th of March, January, or September. Another general awakening. The stars draw back and are extinguished. The bars deepen themselves between the waves. The film of mist thickens on the fields. A redness gathers on the roses, even on the pale rose that hangs by the bedroom window. A bird chirps. Cottagers light their early candles. Yes, this is the eternal renewal, the incessant rise and fall and fall and rise again. And in me too the wave rises. It swells, it arches its back. I am aware once more of a new desire something rising beneath me like the proud horse whose rider first spurs and then pulls him back. What enemy do we now perceive advancing against us, you whom I ride now, as we stand pouring this stretch of pavement? It is death. Death is the enemy. It is death against whom I ride with my spear couched and my hair flying back like a young man's, like Percival's, when he galloped in India. I strike spurs into my horse. Against you I will fling myself, unvanquished and unyielding, O oh death. The waves broke on the shore. The end.